right. Test one, test two. Test one, test two. All right. Mike seems to be working now. Fuck me, dude. That sucks. All right. So, uh, for the sake of everything that is holy, I'm going to read all 11 Twitter files, um, uncut, unedited, unbiased, and I'm going to post this to YouTube and post timestamps for each Twitter file in case somebody wants to go to a Twitter file and just listen to that specific Twitter file. So, um, bear with me here. This is about to be probably more or less a three hour ordeal. Um, so let's sit here, have some fun and listen to the fucking shit show. That is the Twitter files. Um, I recorded this previously, but my mic was muted. So let's have fun. Shall we? The Twitter files. What you're about to read is the first installment in a series based upon thousands of internal documents obtained by sources at Twitter. The Twitter files tells an incredible story from inside one of the world's largest and most influential social media platforms. It is a Frankensteinian tale of a human built mechanism grown out the con grown out the control of its designer grown out of control of its designer. Twitter in its conception was a brilliant tool for enabling instant mass communication, making a true real-time global conversation possible for the first time. In an early conception, Twitter more than lived up to its mission statement, giving people the power to create and share ideas, information, and information instantly without barriers. As time progressed, however, the company was slowly forced to add those barriers. Some of the first tools for controlling speech were designed to combat the likes of spam and financial fraudsters. Slowly over time, Twitter staff and executives began to find more and more uses for these tools. Outsiders began petitioning the company to manipulate speech as well, first a little, then more often, then, cons con then constantly. By 2020, requests from connected actors to delete t tweets were routine. One executive would write to another, more to review from the Biden team. The reply would come back handled. And if you can see these, um, these don't show the actual contents of the tweets. They just show links to the tweets and then just say handled these. So to remain unbiased, uh, I cannot confirm nor deny that this is um, any mal, any uh, misdoing, any uh, uh, malintent. Uh, they could be ranging from anything at this point. Celebrities and unknowns alike could be removed or reviewed at the behest of a political party. Again, this doesn't show the actual tweets, so we cannot confirm nor deny whether or not they were removed strictly because they were Republicans or because of something that they said that broke TOS. Both parties had access to these tools. For instance, in 2020, requests from both the Trump White House and the Biden campaign were received and honored. However, this system wasn't balanced. It was based on contacts, because Twitter was and is overwhelmingly staffed by people of one political orientation. There were more channels, more ways to complain, open to the left, well, Democrats, than the right. And to prove this, I guess they posted um, how much was given um, to Twitter by party. Um, yeah. Or given, yeah, given by Twitter to a party. Um, I don't know what that what that's supposed to prove. The resulting slant and content moderation decisions is visible in the documents you're about to read. However, it's also the assessment of the multiple of multiple current and former high level executives. Okay, there was more throat clearing about the process, but screw it. Let's jump forward. The Twitter files, part one. How and why Twitter blocked the Hunter Biden laptop story. On October 14th, 2020, the New York Post published Biden's secret emails, an expose based on the contents of Hunter Biden's abandoned laptop. Twitter took extraordinary, extraordinary steps to suppress the story, removing links and posting warnings that it may be unsafe. They even blocked its transmission via direct message, a tool hitherto reserved for extreme cases e.g. child pornography. White House spokesperson Kaylee McEn McEn McEnany oh, fuck, dude, was locked out of her account for tweeting about the story, prompting a furious letter from Trump campaign staffer Mike Hahn, who seethed, at least pretend to care for the next 20 days. K 
Kaylee McEnany has been locked out of her account from her account for simply talking about the New York Post story. All she did was cite the story and first-hand reporting that has been reported by other outlets and not disputed by the Biden campaign. I need an answer immediately on when, how she will be unlocked. I also don't appreciate how nobody on this team called me regarding the news that you'll be censoring news articles. Like I said, at least pretend to care for the next 20 days. This led public policy executive Caroline Strum to send out a polite WTF query. Several employees noted that there was tension between the comms policy teams, who had little to less control over moderation, and the safety trust teams. From Caroline Strom, hi team, are you able to take a look closer here? Thank you. Strom's note returned the answer that the laptop story had been removed for violation of the company's hacked materials policy. Hi Caroline, thanks for reaching out to us. Per checking, the user was bounced by site integrity for violating our hacked materials policy, adding them here for further insights and guidance. Thanks. Although several sources recalled hearing about a general warning from federal law enforcement that summer about possible foreign hacks, there's no evidence that I've seen of any government involvement in the laptop story. In fact, that might have been the problem. The decision was made at the highest levels of the company, but without the knowledge of CEO Jack Dorsey, with former head of legal policy and trust Vijaya Gad playing a key role. They just freelanced it, is how one former employee characterized the decision. Hacking was the excuse, but within a few hours, pretty much everyone realized that wasn't going to hold, but no one had the guts to reverse it. You can see the confusion in the following lengthy exchange, which ends up including Gad and former Trust and Safety Chief Yoel Roth. Comms official Trenton Kennedy writes, I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this as unsafe. 2020-10-14. New York Post Hunter Biden laptop article. Privileged and confidential. Our teams continue to investigate the origins of the material included in the reporting. Trenton Kennedy. I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this as unsafe, and I think the best explainability argument for this externally would be that we're waiting to understand if the story is a result of hacked materials. We'll face hard questions on this if we don't have some kind of solid reasoning for marking the link unsafe. Katie Rosborough. Will we also mark similar stories as unsafe? Linking the Fox News article explaining the Hunter Biden emails Senate Homeland Security Committee investigating hard drive lab. By this point, everyone knew this was fucked, said one former employee, but the response was essentially to err on the side of continuing to err. Yol Roth. The policy basis is hacked materials. Though as discussed, this is an emerging situation where the facts remain unclear. Given the severe risks here and lessons of 2016, we're erring on the side of including a warning and preventing this content from being amplified. Jaya Gad. What is the warning that will come up? Yol Roth. When you click the link, you'll see the generic unsafe URL message referencing spam, malware, and violations of the Twitter rules. Pardon me. Not ideal, but it's the only thing we have. Ian Plunkett, new. Whatever we do in the comms, this will become a biased claim for Jack pre-hearing immediately. Let's make it clear we're proactively but cautiously interpreting this through the lens of our hacked materials policy and allowing the link with a warning and significant reduction of spread. Former VP of Global Comms, Brandon Borman, asks, can we truthfully claim that is a part of the policy? Brandon Borman, to Ian's point, can we truthfully claim that this is a part of the policy, i.e. as part of our approach, God, excuse me, approach to addressing potentially hacked materials. We're limiting visibility of related stories on Twitter while our investigation is ongoing. To which former Deputy General Counsel Jim Baker again seems to advise staying the non-course because caution is warranted. Jim Baker knew, privileged and confidential. I support the conclusion that we need more facts to assess whether the materials were hacked. At this stage, however, it is reasonable for us to assume that they may have been and that caution is warranted. Ugh, fuck, I'm sorry. Assume that they may have been and that caution is warranted. There are some facts that indicate that the materials may have been hacked, while there are others indicating that the computer was either abandoned and or the owner consented to allow the repair shop to access it for at least some purposes. We simply need more information. A fundamental problem with tech companies and content moderation 
Many people in charge of speech know slash care little about speech and have to be told the basics by outsiders. To wit. God, I'm so sorry. In one humorous exchange on day one, Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna reaches out to Gad to gently suggest she hop on the phone to talk about the backlash of free speech. Khanna was the only Democratic official I could find in the files who expressed concern. Generating huge black backlash on Hill re-speech. Happy to chat if you're up for it. Best row. I sent for my phone. Gad replies quickly, immediately diving into the weeds of Twitter policy. Unaware, Khanna is more worried about the Bill of Rights. Congress, hi, Congressman Khanna. Thank you for reaching out, and we appreciate the heads up. We put out a clarifying thread. God, I'm sorry. We put out a clarifying thread of tweets earlier this evening to explain our policy around the posting of private information and linking directly to hacked materials. The press secretary's account was not permanently suspended. We requested that she delete the tweet containing material that is in violation of our rules and her account is restricted until she complies. I'd be happy to jump on the phone if helpful. My team in D.C., Jessica and Lauren, are copied here and also available to discuss. Kana tries to reroute the conversation to the First Amendment, mention of which is generally hard to find in the files. Rokana to Vijaya Gad. Rokana. Hopefully you're very well, Vijaya. But this seems a violation of the First Amendment principles. If there is a hack of classified information or other information that could expose a serious war crime, and the New York Times was to publish it, I think the New York Times should have that right. A journalist should not be held accountable for the illegal actions of the source unless they actively aided the hack. So to restrict the distribution of that material, especially regarding a presidential candidate, seems not in the keeping of the principles of New York Times v. Sullivan. I say this as a total Biden partisan and convinced he didn't do anything wrong. But the story now has become more about censorship than relatively innocuous emails, and it's become a bigger deal than it would have been. It also is now leading to serious efforts to curtail Section 230, many of which would have been a mistake. I believe Twitter itself should curtail what it recommends or puts in trending news. And your policy against QAnon groups is all good. It's a hard balance. I believe Twitter itself could curtail, should curtail what it recommends or puts in trending news. And your policy against QAnon groups is all good. It's a hard balance. But in the heat of a presidential campaign, restricting dissemination of newspaper articles, even if New York Post is far right, seems like it will invite more backlash than it will do good. Please keep this communication between us and Jack and no need to CC the team or forward to them. Just wanted to offer my two cents. Within a day, head of public policy, Lauren Culbertson, receives a ghastly letter report from Carl Sasbo of the research firm NetChoice, which had already polled 12 members of Congress, 9 R's and 3 D's, from the House Judiciary Committee to rep Judy Chu's to rep Judy Chu's office from Carl Sasbo. Lauren, yesterday, NetChoice's Chris Marchese met informally with nine Republican and three Democratic House staffers to gather intel about Facebook and Twitter in the New York Post story. The staffers hail from the House Judiciary Committee to rep Judy Chu's office. NetChoice lets Twitter know a bloodbath awaits in upcoming Hill hearings, with members saying it's a tipping point, complaining tech has grown so big that they can't even regulate themselves, so government may need to intervene. High-level takeaway. Every Republican said, this is a tipping point, it's just too much, and both Democrats and the Republicans were angry. Sasbo retorts to reports to Twitter that some Hill figures are characterizing the laptop story as tech's access Hollywood moment. When asked just how bad the situation is, one staffer said it's tech's access Hollywood moment, and it has no Hillary to hide behind. Others were more blunt. Tech is screwed, and rightfully so. The Twitter files continued. The First Amendment isn't absolute. Sasbo's letter contains chilling passages relaying Democratic lawmakers' attitudes. They want more moderation, and as for the Bill of Rights, it's not absolute. God, sorry. I'm so sorry. 
The Democrats, meanwhile, complained that the companies were inept. They let conservatives muddy the water and make the Biden campaign look corrupt even though Biden is innocent. They linked this to Hillary Clinton's email scandal. She did nothing wrong, but because the press wouldn't let the story go, it became a scandal far out of proportion. In their mind, social media is doing the same thing. It doesn't moderate enough harmful content, so when it does, like it did yesterday, it becomes a story. If the companies moderated more, conservatives wouldn't even think to use social media for disinformation, misinformation, or otherwise. The Democrats were in agreement. Social media needs to moderate more because they're corrupting democracy and making all truth relative. When pushed on how the government might insist on that, consistent with the First Amendment, they demurred. The First Amendment isn't absolute. And I believe that is the end of the first Twitter files. All right. So for future me, um, timestamp. We are now going to the second Twitter files. Thread, the Twitter files part two, Twitter's secret blacklists. A new Twitter files investigation reveals that teams of Twitter employees build blacklists, preventing disfavored tweets from trending and actively limit the visibility of entire accounts or even trending topics all in secret without informing users. Twitter once had a mission to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. Along the way, barriers nevertheless were erected. Take for example, example Stanford's Dr. J. Bahadachara, who argued that COVID lockdowns would harm children. Twitter secretly placed him on a trends blacklist, which prevented his tweets from trending. Uh, okay. Recent abuse strike, trends blacklist, strike count zero. Professor Stanford School of Medicine, MD, PhD, Health Policy, Infectious Disease, COVID, Health Economics, Scientific Freedom. Okay. Um, what it does not show is what the tweet was that got him uh because i want to see the tweet itself but unbiased or consider the popular right-wing talk show host dan bongino bongino who at one point was slapped with a search blacklist notification spike search blacklist twitter blue verified multiple accounts strike count zero nsfw view SPMA. Again, doesn't show why they were blacklisted. Twitter set the account of conservative activist Charlie Kirk to do not amplify. A recent abuse strike, notification spike, multiple accounts, strike count zero, do not amplify, NSFW view, da 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 da. Again, does not show why they were put on the do not amplify. Twitter denied that it does such things. In 2018, Twitter's Vijaya Gad, then head of legal policy and trust, and Kayvon Bayakapur said, we do not shadow ban. They added, and we certainly don't shadow ban based on political viewpoints or ideology. What many people call shadow banning, Twitter executives and employees call visibility filtering or VF. Multiple high-level sources confirmed its meaning. Think about visibility filtering as being a way for us to suppress what people see to different levels. It's a very powerful tool. One senior Twitter employee told us, VF refers to Twitter's control over user visibility. It used VF to block searches of individual users to limit the scope of a particular tweet's discoverability to block select users' posts from ever appearing on the trending page and from inclusion and hashtag searches. All without users' knowledge. We control visibility quite a bit, and we control the amplification of your content quite a bit. And normal people do not know how much we do. One Twitter engineer told us, two additional Twitter employees confirm. <coughs> the group that decided whether to limit the reach of certain users was the Strategic Response Team, Global X. Global Escalation Team, or SRTGET. 
and often handled up to 200 cases a day. But there were existed a level beyond official ticketing, beyond the rank and file moderators following the company's policy on paper, that is Site Integrity Policy, Policy Escalation Support, known as SIPPES. The secret group included Head of Legal, Policy and Trust, Vijaya Gad, and Global Head of Trust and Safety, Yul Roth. A sub subsequent CEOs, Jack Dorsey and Parag Ag Agrawal, and others. This is where the biggest, most politically sensitive decisions got made. Think high follower account controversial, another Twitter employee told us. For these, there would be no ticket or anything. One of the accounts that rose to this level of scrutiny was Libs of TikTok, an account that was on the trends blacklist and was designated as do not take action on user without consulting with SIP PES. We can see that same warning. It's a high profile. It's active. Notification spike, trends blacklist, recent abuse strike, Twitter blue verified, multiple accounts, strike count two, high profile, NSFW view, other. Again, doesn't show why they are blacklisted. The account, which Shia Raichik began in November 2020 and now boasts over 1.4 million followers, was subjected to six suspensions in 2022 alone. Raichik says each time Raichik was blocked from posting for as long as a week. Twitter repeatedly informed Raichik that she had been suspended for violating Twitter policy against hateful conduct. But in an internal SIP PES memo from October 2022, after her seventh suspension, the committee acknowledged that LTT was not directly engaged in behavior. I just had a stroke. Violative of the hateful conduct policy. See here. Site policy recommendation. Site policy recommends placing libs of TikTok, not verified, in a seven day timeout at the account level, meaning not for specific tweet based on the account's continued pattern of indirectly violating Twitter's hateful conduct policy by tweeting content that either leads to or intends to incite harassment against individuals and institutions that support LGBTQ communities. At this time, site policy has not found explicitly violative tweets, but would uh, which would result in a permanent suspension of the account. This type of enforcement, action, repeated seven-day timeouts at the account level will not lead to permanent suspension. However, should Libs of TikTok engage in any other direct tweet-level violations of any site policy's policies, we will move forward with permanent suspension. Assessment. Since its most recent timeout, while Libs of TikTok has not directly engaged in behavior violative of the hateful conduct policy, the user has continued targeting individuals, allies, supporters of the LGBTQIA community for alleged misconduct. The targeting of at least one of these institutions. And it cuts off there. The committee justified her suspensions internally by claiming her post encouraged online harassment of hospitals and medical providers by insinuating that gender affirming health care is equivalent to child abuse or grooming. Compare this to what happened when Rychek herself was doxxed on November 21st, 2022. A photo of her home with her address was posted in a tweet that has garnered more than 10,000 likes. Oh, God damn. When Rychek told Twitter that her address had been disseminated, she says Twitter support responded with this message. We reviewed the reported content and didn't find it to be in violation of the Twitter rules. No action was taken. The doxing tweet is still up. And we will not be viewing that tweet. Hello. Thanks for reaching out. We reviewed the reported content and didn't find it to be in violation of the Twitter rules. In this case, no action will be taken at this time. If you have further concerns about intellectual property, your privacy, or your personal safety, the following guidelines can be of assistance. <laughs> in internal Slack messages, Twitter employees spoke of using technicalities to restrict the visibility of tweets and subjects. Here's Joel Roth, Twitter's then global head of trust and safety, in a direct message to the colleague, to a colleague in early 2021. A lot of times, SI is used SI has used technicality spam enforcement as a way to solve a problem created by safety under enforcing their policies, which again isn't a problem per se, but it keeps us from addressing the root cause of the issue, which is that our safety policies need some attention. 
Six days later, in a direct message with an employee on the health, misinformation, privacy, and identity research team, Roth requested more research to support expanding non-removal policy interventions like disabling engagements and deamplification visibility filtering. One of the biggest areas I'd love research support on is re non-removal policy interventions like disabling engagements and deamplification visibility filtering. The hypothesis underlying much of what we've implemented is that if, exp if exposure to, e.g., misinformation directly causes harm, we should use remediations that reduce exposure and limiting the spread virality of content is a good way to do that by just reducing prevalence overall. We got Jack on board with implementing this for civic integrity in the near term, but we're going to need to make a more robust case to get this into our repertoire of policy remediations, especially for other policy domains. So I'd love researchers' point of view on that. Roth wrote, the hypothesis underlying much of what we've implemented is that if exposure to, e.g. misinformation, directly causes harm, we should use remediations that reduce exposure, and limiting the spread virality of content is a good way to do that. He added, we got Jack on board with implementing this for civic integrity in the near term, but we're going to need to make a more robust case to get this into our repertoire of policy remediations, especially other policy domains. There is more to come on this story, which is reported by Abigail Schreier, Shellen Berger, MD, Nellie Bolas, Bowles, Isaac Grafstein, and the team, the Free Press, the FP. Keep up with this unfolding story here at our new at our brand new website, thefp.com. The authors have broad and expanding access to, to, for, to Twitter's files. The only condition we agreed to was that the material would first be published on Twitter. We're just getting started on our reporting. Documents cannot tell the whole story here. A big thank you to everyone who has spoken to us so far. Da -da -da -da. Twitter files part three. And again, this is for future me. Go. Timestamp. Threat. The Twitter files. The removal of Donald Trump, part one. October 2020, January 6th. The world knows much of the story of what happened between riots at the Capitol on January 6th and the removal of President Donald Trump from Twitter on January 8th. We'll show you what hasn't been revealed, the erosion of standards within the company in months before J6, decisions by high-ranking executives to violate their own policies and more against the backdrop of ongoing documented interaction with federal agencies. This first installment covers the period before the election through January 6th. Tomorrow, Shellen Berger, MD, will... Oh, okay. ...will detail the chaos inside Twitter on January 7th. On Sunday, Barry Weiss will reveal the secret internal communications from the key date of January 8th. Whatever your opinion on the decision to remove Trump that day, the internal communications at Twitter between January 6th to January 8th, have clear historical import. Even Twitter's employees understood in that moment it was a landmark moment in the annals of speech. Is this the first sitting head of state to ever be suspended? From Censored. As soon as they finished banning Trump, Twitter execs started processing new power. They prepared to ban future presidents and White Houses, perhaps even Joe Biden. The new administration, says one exec, will not be suspended by Twitter unless absolutely necessary. As stated in our ban evasion policy, if it is clear that another account is being used for the purposes of evading a ban, it is also sus subject to suspension. For government accounts such as POTUS and White House, we will not suspend those accounts but will take action to limit their use. However, these accounts will be transitioned over to the new administration in due course and will not be suspended by Twitter unless absolutely necessary to alleviate real-world harm. <clears throat> <clears throat> Twitter executives removed Trump in part over what one executive called the context surrounding. 
actions by Trump and supporters over the course of the election and, frankly, last four-plus years. In the end, they looked at a broad picture, but that approach can cut both ways. Hi, Vijaya. I'm working with Censored on my team to put together a doc to share with you with a point of view from researchers, ours, academics with whom we have been working, etc., on DJT's language as coded incitement to further violence. In the meantime, here is our quick take. The decision on whether to pull that particular tweet or use that as a last straw for Trump depends on many factors, including one, the overall context and narrative in which that tweet lives. We currently analyze tweets and consider them at a tweet by tweet basis, which does not appropriately take into account the context surrounding. You can use the yelling fire into a crowded theater example. Context matters in the narrative that Trump and his friends have pursued over the course of this election and frankly last four plus years must be taken into account when interpreting and analyzing that tweet. Two, the larger question is around our moral imperative and decision as a company, which user sentiment should not drive based on number one, blank and I believe that his tweet does violate our rules when taking that historical context plus current climate into account. The bulk of the internal debate leading to Trump's ban took place in those three January days. However, the intellectual framework was laid in the months preceding the Catholic riots. Before J6, Twitter was a unique mix of automated rules-based enforcement and more subjective moderation by senior executives. As Barry Weiss reported, the firm had a vast array of tools for manipulating visibility, most all of which were thrown at Trump and others pre-J6. As the election approached, senior executives, perhaps under pressure from federal agencies, with whom they met more as time progressed, increasingly struggled with rules and began to speak of VIOs as pretext to do what they likely have done anyway. I'm so sorry. After J6, internal Slack showed Twitter executives getting a kick out of intensified relationships with federal agencies. Here's trust and safety head Joel Roth lamenting a lack of generic enough calendar descriptions to concealing his very interesting meeting partners. And it happens. I'm a big believer in calendar transparency, but I reached a certain point where my meetings became very interesting to people and there weren't meeting names generic enough to cover. Anyway, let me know. Very boring business meeting that is definitely not about Trump. Winky face. Pretty much. Definitely not a meeting with the FBI. I swear. LMAO. These initial reports are based on searches for documents leading to prominent executives whose names are already public. They include Roth, former trust and policy chief Vijaya Gad, and recently plank-walked deputy general counsel and former top FBI lawyer Jim Baker. One particular Slack channel offers a an unique... Oh, dude, I hate that. An unique window into the evolving thinking of top officials in late 2020 and early 2021. On October 8th, 2020, executives opened a channel called US 2020 XFN Enforcement. Through J6, this would be home for discussions about election-related removals, especially ones that involved high-profile accounts, often called VITs or very important tweeters. Hi, everyone. Starting tomorrow, until November 15th, this channel will be used for the following reasons related to the U.S. 2020 elections. Trends identified that required scale investigations, high-profile accounts, escalations that potentially required P... II soft interventions. Scalable solutions required. Edge cases for XFN consultation. Highlight tech issues, bugs, tools, outage, Jira tickets. This is an enforcement channel between T and F. Fucking Jesus Christ, tech terms. To help speed up our response related to election issues over the coming few weeks, Git will start providing a hand over starting APAC shift tomorrow. Using the following template, handover, next shift, da 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 da, Thursday, October, da 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 da, none knows that. Can you please make sure everyone in our team is within the channel? 
the teams that we included are as follows. Site integrity, safety policy, product trust, safety operations, media ops, global escalation team. If you have any questions or concerns, let me know. There was at least some tension between safety operations. A larger department whose staffers used a more rules-based process for addressing issues like porn, scams, and threats. And a smaller, more powerful cadre of senior policy execs like Roth and Gad. The latter group were a high-speed Supreme Court of moderation, issuing content rulings on the fly, often in minutes and based on guesses, gut calls, even Google searches, even in cases involving the president. Hi everyone, received this escalation just now. Breaking news, 50,000 Ohio voters getting wrong absentee ballots out of control a rigged election. A rigged election would be enough to be in violation, right? If the claim of fact were inaccurate, yes. But it looks like that's true. 50,000 Ohio voters to receive new absentee ballots after error found. So they proved that the claim was true and did not remove. During this time, executives were also clearly liaising with federal enforcement and intelligence agencies about moderation of election-related content. While we're, we're still at the start of reviewing the Twitter files, we're finding out more about these interactions every day. Policy Director Nick Pickles is asked if they should say Twitter detects misinfo through ML, human review, and partnerships with outside experts. The employee asks, I know that's been a slippery process, but sure if you want our public explanation to hang on that. In Pickles, are you comfortable with marketing talking about misinfo by saying that we detect it through ML, human review, and partnerships with outside experts? I know it's been a slippery process, so not sure if you want our public explanation to hang our hat on that. Can we just say partnerships? E.g. not sure we describe the FBI DHS as experts or some NGOs that aren't academic. Pickles quickly asks if they could just say partnerships after a pause. He says, e.g., not sure we describe the FBI and DHS as experts. This post about Hunter Biden laptop situation shows that Roth not only met weekly with the FBI and DHS, but with the officer of the director, but with the office of the director of national intelligence. Yol R has checked in. Here's what they said. What's new for you since our last check-in? Hacked materials exploded, we blocked the NYP story, then we unblocked it, but said the opposite. Then said we unblocked it, and now we're in a messy situation where our policy is in shambles. Comms is angry, reporters think we're idiots, and we're refactoring an exceedingly complex policy 18 days out from the election. In short, FML. Weekly sync with FBI, DHS, DNI, re, election security, the meeting happened about 15 minutes after the aforementioned hacked materials implosion. The government declined to share anything useful when asked. Monthly meeting with FBI, FITF. Briefed on several ongoing investigations. Ross reports the FBI, DHS, DNI is almost farcical in its self-flagellating tone. We blocked the NYP story, then unblocked it, but said the opposite. Comms is angry. Reporters think we're idiots. In short, FML. Fuck my life. Some of Roth's later slacks indicate this weekly confabs with the federal law enforcement involved separate meetings. Here, he ghosts the FBI and DHS, respectively, to go first to an Aspen Institute thing, then take a call with Apple. Hey there, I have to miss the FBI and DHS meetings today, unfortunately. I saw you're on the invites for both as our site policy. Can you give me a quick readout if there's anything interesting that comes up? Sure thing. I hope that everything's okay. Yeah, just have conflicts at both times. An Aspen Institute thing this morning on vaccines, then I have to present at, and then a, that I have to present at, and then a call with Apple to avoid us getting kicked out of the App Store during the DHS one. Ah, those both seem very important. Indeed. Here, the FBI sends reports about a pair of tweets, the second of which involve a former Tippecanoe County, Indiana counselor and Republican named John Basham, claiming 
between 2% and 25% of ballots by mail are being rejected for errors. We just got a report from the FBI concerning two tweets, link, related to the shredding of mail-in ballots. This is proven to be false via this, link. Do we have a moment ready for this one? I believe I was deemed no vio on numerous occasions. No violations. You get lit, lit, lit. I want to see you get lit, lit, <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Lit. I appreciate the we gifted the subs. Thank you. We lit, lit, lit. Uh, okay. You get lit, lit, lit. I wanna see you get lit. Thank you. I lit, appreciate lit. it, guys. Thank we you, in the party and we lit, lit. The FBI's lit. second report concerned this tweet by John Basham. Editorial: The Democrats are in complete panic as their massive push for vote by mail is backfiring on them. Two things are unfolding: an unexpected number of registered Republicans are returning ballots. Between two percent and twenty-five percent of ballots by mail are being rejected for errors. <laughs> The FBI flag tweet then got circulated in the enforcement slack. Twitter cited PolitiFact to say the first story was proven to be false, then noted the second was already deemed no violation on numerous occasions. The group then decides to apply a learn how voting is safe and secure label because one commenter says, it's totally normal to have a 2% error rate. Roth then gives the final go-ahead to the process initiated by the FBI. I think we can use the Merlin voting label for this one as is. Examining the entire election enforcement slack, we didn't see one reference to moderation requests from the Trump campaign, the Trump White House, or Republicans generally. We looked. They may exist. We were told they do. However, they were absent here. All right, this is for future me to timestamp. Jesus Christ, I hate everything about this. Uh, now that it's silent, Jail, I appreciate the gifted subs. Thank you so much, buddy. Um. Yo, uh, sore sausage. Um, you're right. I get no pussy. <clears throat> Twitter files part four. Removal of Donald Trump, January 7th. As the pressure builds, Twitter executives build the case for a permanent ban. Oh, Jesus. Okay, this one's not numbered. On January 7th, senior Twitter executives... Create justifications to ban Trump. Seek a change of policy for Trump alone, distinct from other political leaders. Express no concern for the free speech or democracy implications of the ban. This Twitter files is reported by L. Woodhouse. Leighton Woodhouse. For those catching up, please see part one, where M. Taibbi documents how senior Twitter executives violated their own policies to prevent the spread of accurate information about Hunter Biden's laptop where Barry Weiss shows how senior Twitter execs created secret blacklists to de-amplify disfavored Twitter users, not just specific tweets, and part three, where M. Taibbi documents how senior Twitter execs censored tweets by Trump in the run-up to the November 2020 election while regularly engaging with representatives of U.S. government law enforcement agencies. Okay, I said I'd, I'm, I'm going to keep this unbiased. I'm not going to comment on this. For years, Twitter had resisted calls to ban Trump. Blocking a world leader from Twitter, it wrote in 2018, would hide important info and hamper necessary discussion around their words and actions. Direct quote. Dear God. But after the events of J J uh, J6, the internal and external pressures on Twitter CEO Jack grows. Former First Lady Michelle Obama, tech journalist Kara Swisher, ADL High Tech VC, Chris Saka, and many others publicly call on Twitter to permanently ban Trump. You've got blood on your hands, Jack and Zuck. For four years, you've rationalized this terror. Inciting violent treason is not a free speech exercise. If you work at those companies, it's on you too. Shut it down. Now is time for Silicon Valley companies to stop enabling this monstrous behavior and go even further than they have already by permanently banning this man from their platforms and putting in place policies to prevent their technology from being used by the nation's leaders to, to fuel insurrection. From Michelle Obama. It's time for social media platforms to permanently ban Trump. 
and from Jonathan Greenblatt, two bare minimum tweets after the Capitol has been stormed by extremists is too little, too late. Jack, it's overdue to suspend Donald Trump until his account stops promoting disinformation and inciting violence. The, tweet, the tweets in question by Donald Trump are, I am asking for everyone at the U.S. US Capitol to remain peaceful. No violence. Remember, we are the party of law and order. Respect the law and our great men and women in blue. Thank you. Please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They truly, they are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they are asked to previously certify. USA demands the truth. And then is a ADL statement on the uh, violence at the U.S. Capitol building. <clears throat> Dorsey was on a vacation in French Polynesia the week of January 4th to 8th, 2021. He phoned into meetings, but also delegated much of the handling of the situation to senior execs Yo Yol, Yol Roth, Twitter's global head of trust and safety, and Vijaya Gat head of legal tr policy and trust. As context, it's important to understand that Twitter staff and senior executives were overwhelmingly progressive. In 2018, 2020, and 2022, 96, 98, 99% of Twitter staff's political donations went to Democrats. In 2017, Roth tweeted that there were actual Nazis in the White House. On April 2022, Roth told a colleague that his goal is to drive change in the world, which is why he decided not to become an academic. Yes, that person in the pink hat is clearly a bigger threat to your brand of feminism than actual Nazis in the White House. Yeah, academia is by far the most abusive working environment I've ever been in. The entire system is exploitative on a ton of ways and also not necessarily productive if your goal is to drive change in the world. Which was the main reason I left. On January 7th, Jack emails employees saying Twitter needs to remain consistent in its policies, including the right of users to return to Twitter after temporary suspension. After Roth reassures an employee that people who care about this aren't happy with where we are. Yo, Roth. Jack's emails have been fine. But ultimately, I think people want to hear from Vijaya or Dell or someone closer to the specifics of this who can reassure them that people who care about this are thinking deeply about these problems and aren't happy with where we are. A few engineers have reached out to me directly about it, and I'm chatting with them. But it's so clear that they just want to know that someone is doing something about this. And it's not that we're ignoring the issues here. I think there's also an opportunity to help people understand that. While it seems obvious and simple that we should permaban this personal account, we can't afford to take afford to take that immediate action without first playing the movie out and anticipating all the other things that can happen, and then figure out the plans for those possible scenarios. E.g., if we suspend the personal account and he posts the same thing on the official government account, do we suspend that too? People can be forgiven for not thinking beyond the thing that's immediately in front of them. But Jack, Vijaya, Dell, you don't have the luxury of just pulling the trigger without thinking things through. We tell them repeatedly that people are on it and people are working on it. And they're scratching their heads wondering, how hard can it be to decide if the single account is in violation? Around 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time, Roth DMs his colleagues with news that he is excited to share. Guess what, he writes. Jack just approved repeat offender for civic integrity. The new approach would create a system where five violations, strikes, would result in a permanent suspension. Guess what? Jack does approve repeat offender for a civil integrity. Directional approach would be something like labels which are severe enough to result in disabled engagements incur strikes. Strike one, label only. Strike two, label only. Strike three, label plus 12 hour timeout. Strike four, label plus seven day timeout. Strike five, permanent suspension. Progress, exclaimed a member of Roth's trust and safety team. The exchange between Roth and his colleagues makes clear that they had been pushing Jack for greater restrictions on the speech Twitter allows around elections. The colleague wants to know if the decision means Trump can finally be banned. 
The person asks, does the incitement to violence aspect change that calculus? Roth says it doesn't. Trump continues to just have have his one strike remaining. Progress, does this affect our approach to Trump, who I think we publicly said had one remaining strike, or does the incitement to violence aspect change that calculus? Trump continues to just have his one strike. This is for everything else. Roth's colleague's query about incitement to violence heavily foreshadows what will happen the following day. On January 8th, Twitter announces a permanent ban on Trump due to the risk of further incitement of violence. On J8, Twitter says its ban is based on specifically how Trump's tweets were being received and interpreted. But in 2019, Twitter said it did not attempt to determine all potential interpretations of the content or its intent. Specifically, how they are being received and interpreted on and off Twitter, we have permanently suspended the account due to the risk of further incitement of violence. We focus on the language of reported tweets and do not attempt to, un to determine all potential interpretations of the content or its intent. The only serious concern we found expressed within Twitter over the implications for free speech and democracy of banning Trump came from a junior person in the organization. It was tucked away in a lower-level Slack channel known as Site Integrity Auto. This might be an unpopular opinion, but one-off ad hoc decisions like this that don't appear rooted in policy are, in my honest opinion, a slippery slope and reflect an alternatively equally dictatorial problem. This now appears to be a fiat by an online platform CEO with a global presence that can gatekeep speech for the entire world, which seems unsustainable. This might be an unpopular opinion, but one on da 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 da. Just read that. Twitter employees use the term one off frequently in their Slack discussions. Its frequent use reveals significant employee discretion over when and whether to apply warning labels on tweets and strikes on users. Here are the typical examples. Could I bounce with the strike? I don't see any scenario where we would decide not to bounce here. Just want to check if there are any concerns. Otherwise, I can bounce other RTP and close this one before I go. FYI's account for review. U.S. Asset. Wow, stroke. USA secession. We are trying to understand the one-off decision here. Of Friday, November 26th. There's always abuse one-off. Bounce one off is the option. Recall from Twitter Files 2 by Barry Weiss that recording to Twitter staff, we control visibility quite a bit and we control the amplification of our content quite a bit and normal people do not know how much we do. Twitter employees recognize the difference between their own politics and Twitter's terms of service, but they also engage in complex interpretations of content in order to stamp out prohibitive tweets as a series of exchanges over the stop the steal hashtag reveal. Hey, hope you're doing okay. We're able to get some sleep. And we're able to get some sleep. Can we or have we already discussed blocking the stop the steal hashtag? It's furthering fake news in a dangerous way from what I can tell. Hey there, we're proactively surfacing that content for review under civic integrity and it should be blocked from type ahead and trends. If you're seeing it in either of the latter two, let me know ASAP and PT can fix. I just saw the hashtag and then did a search on it and all the content was appalling. So I don't think it's showing up elsewhere. Thank you for all you're doing. Hmm. I'll flag to the election squad. Remember that what I find appalling and what is TOS VIO violations are not an exact overlap. <laughs> Roth immediately DMs a colleague to ask what they add that they add stop the steal and QAnon conspiracy term Kraken to, <laughs> to a blacklist of terms to be deamplified. Roth's colleague objects that blacklisting stop the steal risks deamplifying counter speech that validates the election. No, there's a lot going on. Any objections to adding stop the steal and Kraken to the CHAQ term lists if they aren't already there? The daylight separating Q and the stop the steal stuff now is effectively zero. Kraken for sure if it's not already there. I'm too worried about the risk of deamplifying counter speech with stop the steal. Ah. Oh, acknowledge. <laughs> nice. Indeed notes Roth's colleague a quick search of top, of top stop the steal tweets and their counter speech. 
but they quickly come up with a solution. The Amplify accounts would stop this deal in the name profile, since those are not affiliated with counter speech. Yeah, just a quick search of stop the steal tweets and their counter speech. Kraken, I'm comfortable with. Top tweets are generally queue related, and I'm noticing an absence of counter speech. It's also common on profiles. Actually, can we deamplify accounts with stop the steal in the name profile level? Those are not affiliated with counter speech. But it turns out that even blacklisting Kraken is less straightforward than they thought. That's because Kraken, in addition to be a QAnon conspiracy theory based on the mythical Norwegian sea monster, is also the name of a cryptocurrency exchange and was thus a <laughs> Nice. Also, I think adding Kraken to the various bots may have broken something. <laughs> oh, guys, I removed Kraken the other day, FYI. It did break something. There's an app called Kraken app or something. If we allow list that, no concerns about putting it back, but would want to see if there are other FPs. The brand, <sighs> the brand Kraken account is allowed listed FYIW. Employees struggle with whether to punish users who share screenshots of Trump's deleted J6 tweets. We should bounce these tweets with a strike given the screenshot violates the policy. They are criticizing Trump, so I'm a bit hesitant with applying strike to this user. Fuck off. Oh my god. Oh wait. Hi team. Should we bounce people sharing Trump? actioned tweets as one-off thanks fuck off oh my god even twitter says it's inciting violence these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long go home with love and in peace remember this day forever we should bounce these tweets with a strike given the screenshot violates the policy they are commenting and criticizing Trump, so I'm a bit hesitant with applying strike to this user. Mm. Unbiased. What if a user dislikes Trump and objects to Twitter censorship? The tweet still gets deleted, but since the intention is not to deny the election result, no punishing strike is applied. If there are instances where the intent, where the intent is unclear, please feel free to raise. I don't even like the man, but I'm not going to put up with Twitter deleting opinions they don't like. I'm in agreement. One-off works for commentary. Strike of a tweet is agreeing with tweet's view. What if it's neutral, sharing opinion like, told you it violates Twitter's policy? Tweet delete only? I would agree with tweet delete only on agreeing with the policy. Can I get your opinion here? Would agree on delete only in instances where the content is not shared with abusive intent. Thanks, everyone. There are instances where the intent is unclear. Feel free to raise. Around noon, a confused senior executive in advertising sales sends a DM to Roth. Sales exec. Jack says we will permanently, sus permanently suspend Trump if our policies are violated after a 12-hour account lock. What policies is Jack talking about? Roth, any policy violation. <sighs> Hi, y'all. I have a question regarding Twitter safety thread regarding POTUS and Jack's email. Jack says, we will permanently suspend if our policies are violated after 12-hour account lock. What policies is Jack talking about? Is spreading misinfo a violation, like his past tweets about election? Or is it more about a tweet inciting violence? I'm asking because we, we are getting tons of calls from clients following FBIG decision. So some clarity would be great. Thanks. Hey, JP. For internal awareness, this would be any policy violation, not just limited to elections. But before sharing anything, please coordinate with Blank on the comm side. Obviously, a ton of interest in our position on this. Want to ensure we stay aligned. <sighs> what happens next is essential to understanding how Twitter justified banning Trump. Sales exec. Are we dropping the public interest policy now? Roth, six hours later. In this specific case, we're changing our public interest approach for this account. <coughs> Thanks, so. We'll connect with comms team for sure. One last question. In the past, we've exempted policy violation from a world leader due to the public interest value. We are dropping the public interest now, and any new violation could be a trigger. For me to understand, again, we'll check with comms re regarding what we can, cannot share publicly. Apologies for the slow reply. 
I've been back to back all day today. In this specific case, we're changing our public interest approach for his account to say any violation would result in suspension. We are completely getting rid of the public interest approach, although we do uh, we do have work planned on revisions in H1 2021. The ad exec is referring to Twitter's policy of public interest exceptions, which allows the content of elected officials, even if it violates Twitter's rules, if it directly contributes to understanding or discussion of a matter of public concern. At present... At present, we limit exceptions to one critical type of public interest content, tweets from elected and government officials, given the significant public interest in knowing and being able to discuss their actions and statements. Roth pushes for a permanent suspension of Representative Matt Gates, even though it doesn't quite fit anywhere. Duh. It's a kind of test case for the rationale for banning Trump. I'm trying to talk Twitter safety team into removal as a conspiracy that invites violence. What's latest on Antifa claims? Anything brewing policy-wise? C is yelling from the other room that we should just ban Gates. Yeah, SP and SI are working on that. It doesn't quite fit anywhere. Duh. Right. But I'm trying to talk safety into treating it as incitement. I think we'll get over the line for removal as a conspiracy that invites violence, incites violence. Rajaya was directly okay with it. Uh, Matt Gates wasn't banned on Twitter, though, was he? We'll find out. Around 2.30, comms executives DM Roth to say that they don't want to make it a big deal of the QAnon ban to the media because they fear if we push this, it looks like we're trying to offer up something in place of the thing everyone wants, meaning a Trump ban. We're good either way. We'll discuss, but I'm genuinely in the space of let's start talking, taking action and not do a big comms push around this. We can explain why if we're asked, but worry if we push this, it looks... Like we're trying to offer up something in place of the thing everyone wants. Yup. That evening, a Twitter engineer DMs to Roth to say, I feel a lot of debates around exceptions stem from the fact that Trump's account is not technically different from anybody else and yet treated differently due to his personal status without corresponding Twitter rules. Hi, y'all. I'm sure you are very busy right now, and my apologies if this is a distraction to your work. I wonder if there has been discussion about reshaping the rules around official accounts, e.g. Donald Trump. In other accounts, e.g. real Donald Trump, or an unverified account. I feel a lot of debates around exceptions stem from the fact that Trump's account is not technically different from anybody else, and yet treated differently due to his personal status, without corresponding Twitter rules to clarify the responsibilities that should come with that status. Roth's response hints at how Twitter would justify deviating from its long-standing policy. To put a different spin on it, policy is one part of the system of how Twitter works. We ran into the world changing faster than we were able to either adapt the product or the policy. I think you're spot on. To put a different spin on it, policy is one part of the system of how Twitter works. There are different things you can change when you want to affect different behaviors. Policy and enforcement are one, the product is another. Partnerships and outreach are another, etc. And all of that is situated in a bigger system, i.e. the world, which influences how everything else operates in practice. When you change one part of the system, you necessarily have to adapt the rest. And I think we ran into the world changing faster than we were able to either adapt the product or the policy. But we can and should do both, not directly. The evening of January 7th, the same junior employee who expressed an unpopular opinion about ad hoc decisions that don't appear rooted in policy speaks up one last time before the end of the day. This might be an unpopular opinion. Oh, he already said that. Earlier that day, the employee wrote, My concern is specifically surrounding the unarticulated logic of the decision by Facebook. That space fills with the idea, conspiracy theory, that all inherent moguls sit around like kings casually deciding what people can and cannot see. My concern is specifically surrounding the unarticulated logic of the decision by Facebook. 
That's the space that fills with the idea, conspiracy theory, that all social media heads and internet moguls at every layer sit around like kings casually deciding what people can and cannot see. And it's unhelpful to the internet ecosystem as a whole. Again, this is in my honest opinion only. The employee loads later in the day, later in the day and Will Oramus noticed the inconsistency too, linking to an article for 1-0 at Medium called Facebook Chucked Its Own Rulebook to Ban Trump. And then in case anybody wants to read it, there's the link, or there's the title of it. The underlying problem, writes Will Oramus, is that the dominant platforms have always been loath to own up to their subjectivity because it highlights the extraordinary, unfettered power they wield over the global public square. In quotations, and places the responsibility for that power... Oh, it's continuing the quote. Over the global public square, and places that responsibility for that power on their own shoulders. So they hide behind an ever-changing rulebook, alternate alternately pointing to it when it's convenient and shoving it under the nearest rug when it isn't. Facebook's suspension of Trump now puts Twitter in an awkward position. If Trump does indeed return to Twitter, the pressure on Twitter will ramp up to find a pretext to which, on which to ban him as well. Indeed, and as Barry Weiss will show tomorrow, that's exactly what happened. And then tweeting, Twitter files. Oh, God, dude. Why am I doing this to myself? Oh, God, dude. All right. I'm going to take this moment. To blow my nose. Huh. And just contemplate what I'm doing. We got six more to go. Future me, timestamp. Thread, the Twitter files, part five. The removal of Trump from Twitter. Oh. On the morning of January 8th, President Donald Trump, with one remaining strike before being at risk of permanent suspension from Twitter, tweets twice. At 6.46 a.m., the 75 million great American patriots who voted for me, America first and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape, or form. There's a tweet. At 7.44 a.m., to all of those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. Tweet. For years, Twitter had restricted... No, Koina, I'm literally just reading this uh, to post on YouTube and to have timestamps uh, for people to just go to. There's not a panel. I'm literally reading this for my own sanity. That's it. <laughs> for years, Twitter had resisted calls, both internal and external, to ban Trump from the, gr on the grounds that blocking a world leader from the platform or removing their controversial tweets would hide important information that people should be able to see in debate. <laughs> I am a masochist. Our mission is to provide a forum that enables people to be informed and to engage their leaders directly. The company wrote in 2019, Twitter's aim was to protect the public's right to hear from their leaders and to hold them to account. And then that is the, um, I guess, rules uh, for world leaders on Twitter. No, I'm not a masochist, Corner. I'm just tired of people quoting these things like they're gospel and not understanding a damn thing that they're actually saying. Like, I've been at this for an hour. I've read four of them, okay? And the first one, talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story, literally said nothing. Said nothing. Sorry, I said unbiased. I'm staying unbiased. Staying unbiased. Disregard that, please, God. But after January 6th, as Matt Taibbi and Schellenberger have documented, pressure grew, both inside and outside of Twitter, to ban Trump. There was dissenters inside Twitter, 
Maybe because I am from China, said one employee on January 7th, I deeply understand how censorship can destroy the public conversation. Koina, if you want to sit here and listen to this, more power to you. I'm losing my mind. Maybe because I'm from China, I deeply understand how censorship can destroy the public conversation. I understand this fear, but I also think it's important to understand that censorship by a government is very different than censorship of the government. The First Amendment in the United States and similar legislation in other countries with similar concepts exist specifically to prevent the government from silencing the people. I respect that, but realistically, we impose far stricter rules on effectively everyone else on the platform. We started labeling, restricting his tweets when they became a threat to democracy and seemed like that was our red line. Yesterday, he clearly attempted to overthrow our democratic system of government and showed no signs of remorse. If this is not a clear reason to suspend him, again, as an unhinged ruler attempting to subvert the most powerful democracy in the world, I'm not sure what would be. Shrug. But voices like that one appear to have been a distinct minority within the company. Across Slack channels, many Twitter employees were upset that Trump hadn't been banned earlier. After January 6th, Twitter employees organized to demand their employer ban Trump. There was a lot of employee advocacy happening, said one Twitter employee. I'm struggling to understand the decision not to ban Trump altogether. Given he is exciting, inciting people to violence that has led to people being killed, and I think we owe people an explanation externally. This is the elephant in the room. It feels like Twitter policy is engaged with someone acting in bad faith, and we won't acknowledge it. Do we have any belief that Trump stopped tweeting incitements to violence? If Alex Jones was shut down for get your battle rifles, he's far exceeded that standard. I think a lot of employees must share these concerns. Is there any sort of channel or group where we can organize more action? There was a lot of employee advocacy happening both here and in whatever the fuck. I understand he was our president and that may have been the reason why we were hesitant to do it. But I think come January 20th, there's absolutely no excuse why his account shouldn't be suspended for good. I have friends with 1K followers that cut off. We have to do the right thing and ban his account, said one staffer. It's pretty obvious he's going to try and thread the needle of incitement without violating the rules, said another. That last sentence, we have to do the right thing here and ban his account. That last sentence, we have to do the right thing here and ban his account. The last sentence, we have to do the right thing here and ban his account. We don't have a good track record of acting on his account, except in the clearest and most explicit of cases, and even then. In my opinion, extraordinary circumstances demand extraordinary leadership. It took three years, but I've lost faith. A actual votes, Donald Trump Republican Party, 232, 46.9%, 74,223,744. Second this, it's pretty obvious he's going to try and thread the needle of incitement while not violating the rules. In the early afternoon of January 8th, the Washington Post published an open letter signed by over 300 Twitter employees to CEO Jack Dorsey demanding Trump's ban. We must examine Twitter's complicity in what President-elect Biden has rightly termed insurrection. But the Twitter staff assigned to evaluate tweets quickly concluded that Trump had not violated Twitter's policies. I think we'd have a hard time saying this is incitement, wrote one staffer. It's pretty clear he's saying the American patriots are the ones who voted for him and not the terrorists. We can call them that, right? From Wednesday. Another staffer agreed. Don't see the incitement angle here. I see Blank was pinged to us to ask about incitement for the GJ, DJ, D, DJT tweet and want to see if we can align. I don't see the incitement of fear. What PC could it be trying to incite fear about? I think we'd have a hard time saying this is incitement. It's pretty clear he's saying the American patriots are the ones who voted for him and not the terrorists. We can call them that, right? From Wednesday. Don't see the incitement angle here. I also am not seeing clear or coded incitement in the Donald J. Trump tweet, wrote Anika Navaroli, a Twitter policy official. I'll respond in the elections channel to say that our team has assessed and found no violations or violations. 
for the GJ, DJ T1. Yep. Flagging that Yol is blah, looking for an assessment of the DJ D tweet in the HPDC crisis channel. She does just that. As an FYI, safety has assessed the Donald Trump tweet above and determined that there was no violation of our policies at this time. I stepped out for a while. Let me know, yo, if any action will be taken. <coughs> As an FYI, safety has assessed the Donald Trump tweet above and determined that there is no violation of our policies at this time. Later, Navaroli would testify in the House January 6th committee. For months, I had been begging and anticipating and attempting to raise the reality that if nothing, we made no intervention into what I saw occurring. People were going to die. <coughs> Next, Twitter safety team decides that Trump's 7.44 a.m. tweet is also not in violation. They're unequivocal. They're unequivocal. It's a clear no violation. It's just to say he's not attending the inauguration. People might be saying that this is the proof he doesn't support a peaceful transition. <coughs> to understand Twitter's decision to ban Trump, we must consider how Twitter deals with other heads of state and political leaders, including in Iran, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. In June 2018, Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei tweeted, Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated. It is possible and it will happen. Twitter neither deleted the tweet nor banned the Ayatollah. Ayatollah. I don't know what that date means. In October 2020, the former Malaysian Prime Minister said it was a right for Muslims to kill millions of French people. Twitter deleted his tweet for glorifying violence, but he remains on the platform. The tweet below was taken from the Wayback Machine. <coughs> the thing you have to realize about this right here, the statement that they're making, Twitter deleted his tweet for glorifying violence, but he remains on the platform. The problem with that is that they are assuming that just by saying these things warrant a deleted profile. But what they're not taking into account was how many strikes this person has prior. Because the argument with Trump was that he had four strikes and needed one more. They don't know how many strikes this person had. Or if they do know, they're not showing it intentionally. <clears throat> Mohamedou Buhari the president of Nigeria incited violence against pro Biafra groups. Those of us in the fields for 30 months who went through the war, he wrote, will treat them in the language they understand. Twitter deleted the tweet, but didn't ban Buhari. Again, they're not showing what uh, Buhari's previous strikes were, if any. Um, so again, this doesn't help them at all. <coughs> I need a water. In October 2021, Twitter allowed Ethiopian Prime Minister Abai Ahmed to call on citizens to take up arms against the Tigray re region. Twitter allowed the tweet to remain up and did not ban the Prime Minister. Uh, again, it's not showing reasoning. In early February 2021, Prime Minister excuse me, Narendra Modi's government threatened to arrest Twitter employees in India and to incarcerate them for up to seven years after they restored hundreds of accounts that had been critical of him. Twitter did not ban Modi. Again, does not explain prior strikes, if any, and does not give reasoning why it should have been banned. But Twitter executives did ban Trump, even though key staffers said that Trump had not incited violence, not even in a coded way. Less than 90 minutes after Twitter employees had determined that Trump's tweets were not in violation of Twitter policy, Vijay Gad, Twitter's head of legal and policy and trust, asked whether it could, in fact, be coded incitement to further violence. Thanks. The biggest question is whether a tweet like the one this morning from Trump, which isn't a rule violation on its face, is being used as a coded incitement to further violence. 
If you have any context or insight we should consider, I'm all ears. E.g. use of term American Patriots, and they will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape, or form. This is an interesting question. I'm going to speak with my team ASAP to see if we can run a quick survey to get reactions to the language contained in the tweet and get back to you. Not sure I would rely on a survey. I worry about how that would be perceived externally. Wondering if we have anything in past research that could be relevant. A few minutes later, Twitter employees on the scaled enforcement team suggested that Trump's tweets may have violated Twitter's glorification of violent policy. If you interpreted the phrase American Patriots to refer to the rioters. Team, Scale is asking if we could consider Trump's tweet for Gov if we consider American Patriots to, to refer to the rioters. They have a point from my POV. Team, my laptop is frozen. We'll rejoin ASAP. Scale has said they understand our position but will continue to push their GOV assessment with leadership. They see it that he is the leader of the vi of a violent extremist group who's glorifying the get lit, recent lit, actions. Lit, lit. I wanna see it get lit, lit, lit. We in the party. Thank you for the one dollar. <laughs> I wanna I see it. it get lit. Do you think we should square off of government in the GJ DJT assessment, or would it be helpful at this point? I think it could be helpful to maybe have a write-up of what a violation assessment could look like. Just in case, scale tips the balance, and that becomes the decision. <laughs> Again, thank you for the dollar, buddy. Things escalate from there. Members of that team came to view him as the leader of a terrorist group, responsible for violent deaths comparable to Christchurch shooter or Hit Hitler, and on that basis, and on the totality of his tweets, he should be deplatformed. Just to update you, I spoke to Blank just now. They understand our assessment of this individual tweet, but they now view him as the leader of a terrorist group responsible for violence, deaths comparable to Christchurch shooter or Hitler, and on that basis, and on the totality of his tweets, he should be deplatformed. They will continue to push that argument with leadership, and we will see where it falls. Could be the Family Guy stream. Who knows? Two hours later, Twitter executives host a 30-minute all-staff meeting. Jack Dorsey and Vijaya Gad answer staff questions as to why Trump wasn't banned yet. But they make some employees angrier. Multiple tweets, Twitter employees, have quoted the banality of evil suggesting that people implementing our policies are like Nazis following orders, says Joel Roth to a colleague. I'm not sure who should hear this, but if you look at the conversation and blah, plenty of employees are not responding well to the 30 minute brief. I feel people want to feel heard and having something with the right purview to reason with. And yet I am sure Jack and Vijaya are totally saturated. I wonder if we can mobilize people who are on the peripheral of decision making, but not all consumed to engage with internal discussions. Yeah, I've been keeping an eye on it. Candidly, not a lot of people who were who are close to the decisions would feel safe engaging there. Multiple tweets have quoted the banality of evil, suggesting that people implementing our policies are like Nazis following orders, which as someone responsible for our policies who had direct family members in Auschwitz, it's not exactly an environment I want to wade into. People are angry and want to express themselves, but the way the conversation happens can close off meaningful engagement. Dorsey requested simpler language to explain Trump's suspension. Roth wrote, God help us, this makes me think he wants to share it publicly. Yeah, Andrew Tate did get arrested. Fuck, crazy. If we, cl get, if we get close to suspension and an analysis of 8chan or Parler as part of the decision, any links to that content would be helpful for us with Trusted. If possible, I'd like those services to pay a price here. Yep, noted. Dell is rewriting the doc per request from Jack to make it simpler, which God helps us, which God help us makes me think he wants to share it publicly. One hour later, Twitter announces Trump's permanent suspension due to the risk of further incitement of violence. Many at Twitter were ecstatic. Trump is suspended. 
OMG! Exclamation. Ah. Well, this feels like a piece of history. It is. Saw the message. Thank you, everyone, for your impactful work this week, for the discussion and for the drafting, all these complex assessments. I am very proud to work and learn from you every day. Wishing you had a good weekend. Also, uh, don't really appreciate the language that was used in that comment. So, yeah, permud. Don't care much for that. And congratulatory, big props to whoever in trust and safety is sitting there whack a mole those Trump accounts. Can we get them one of these awesome cards I've heard about? Definitely some extraordinary acts of awesomeness going on around Twitter right now. Don Jr. account needs to be locked too. By the next day, employees expressed eagerness to tackle medical misinformation as soon as possible. What Blank said, yes, we absolutely plan to do this in 2021, with the timeline being as soon as possible. COVID is one specific disease. Medical misinformation is a much broader category of harmful content. We've laid a lot of the groundwork for policy and product behavior through our work on COVID and the election. The Misinfo Policy Team and TNS, along with the folks in health experience, TWS, research, and other teams across the company, are now focused on getting to a place of improved maturity in how our policies are actualized across reporting, operations, global scale, scope, etc., We'll have more to share on this soon. Thank you. For the longest time, Twitter's stance was that we aren't the arbiter of truth, wrote another employee, which I respected, but never gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Very excited to see us handling more categories of misinformation. For the longest time, Twitter's stance was that we aren't the arbiter of truth, which I respected, but never gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling. That said, my dad is an MD, to give context, and medical misinformation is a really hard topic, even for COVID-19. We only covered a narrow category of information. <coughs> As an example is take vitamin C, vitamin D, elderberry, and xylitol with GSE daily to reduce COVID-19 risk. Good information, creative marketing, or misinformation? Personally, I'm not sure, and I suspect there are views on both sides. But Twitter's COO, Parag Agro Agrawal, who would later secede Dorsey as CEO, told head of security Mudge Zatko, I think a few, a few of us should brainstorm the ripple effects of Trump's ban. Agrawal added, centralized content moderation, in my opinion, has reached a breaking point. I think a few of us should brainstorm the ripple effects and potential fragmentation of public conversation and how we might adapt. Who are you suggesting? Not sure. A few of us on staff may be a start. The future of public conversation feels uncertain to me. To my mind, we need to move fast towards opening up control over policies and enforcement and decentralizing it. Centralized content moderation, in my opinion, has reached a breaking point now. Interested to hear what people think now that it's played out the way it has. I think more... Important, I think a more important question now is the future of public conversation. In my mind, this is the end of the road for centralized content moderation. Hard to believe that this approach will be sustainable moving forward. S suggested a mudge that a few of us got together to anticipate ripple effects and decide on how we might mobilize for the change ahead. Outside the United States, Twitter's decision to ban Trump raised alarms, including with French President Emmanuel Macron, German Prime Minister Angela Merkel, and Mexico's President Andres Manuel López Obrador. Macron told an audience he didn't want to live in a democracy where the key decisions were made by private players. I want it to be decided by a law voted by a representative, or by regulation, Governance, democratically discussed and approved by Democratic leaders. Merkel's spokesperson called Twitter's decision to ban Trump from its platform problematic and added that the freedom of opinion is of elementary significance. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny criticized the ban as an unacceptable act of censorship. 
Whether you agree with Navalny and Macron or the executives at Twitter, we hope that this installment of the Twitter files gave you insight into that unprecedented decision. From the outset, our goal in investigating this story was to discover and document the steps leading up to banning of Trump and to put that choice into context. Ultimately, the concerns about Twitter's efforts to censor news about Hunter Biden's laptop, blacklist disfavored views, and ban a president aren't about the past choices of executives in a social media company. They're about the power of a handful of people at a private company to influence the public discourse and democracy. This was reported by Schellenberger, Isaac Grafstein, Snoozy Weiss, Olivia Rheingold, Peter Svodnik, Nellie Bowles. Follow all of our work at the Free Press at the FP. Please click this to subscribe to the FP, where you can continue reading and supporting independent journalism. The Twitter files are revealing more every day about how the government collects, analyzes, and flags your social media content. Making sure the mic, okay. And check, check, all right. Recording second half. The Twitter files are revealing more every day about how the government collects, analyzes, and flags your social media content. Twitter's contract with the FBI was constant and pervasive, as if it were a subsidiary. Between January 2020 and November 2022, there were over 150 emails between the FBI and former Twitter trust and safety chief Yul Roth. Some are mundane, like San Francisco agent Elvis Chan wishing Roth a happy new year, along with a reminder to attend our quarterly call next week. Others are requests for information into Twitter users related to active investigations. But a surprisingly high number are requests by the FBI for Twitter to take action on election misinformation, even involving joke tweets from low follower accounts. The FBI Social Media Focus Task Force, known as FTIF, created in the wake of the 2016 election, swelled to 80 agents and corresponded with Twitter to identify alleged foreign influence and election tampering of all kinds. Federal intelligence and law enforcement reached into Twitter included the Department of Homeland Security, which partnered with security contractors and think tanks to pressure Twitter to moderate content. It's no secret the government analyzes bulk data for all sorts of purposes, everything from tracking terror suspects to making economic forecasts. The Twitter files show something new. Agencies like the FBI and DHS regularly sending social media content to Twitter through multiple entry points pre-flagged for moderation. What stands out is the sheer quantity of reports from the government. Some are aggregated from public hotlines. Election Day protocol for FBI headquarters is to stand up a National Election Command Post, which provides a centralized location for assessing election-related threats. Status reports and complaints are tracked. Have a tip? Send it to tips.fbi.gov or not call 915-832-5000. Protect your voice. Protect your vote. God, I need a moderator in here right now. An unanswered question, do agencies like FBI and DHS do in-house flagging work themselves or farm it out? You have to prove to me that inside the fucking government you can do any kind of massive data or AI search, says one former intelligence officer. Hello Twitter contacts! The master canine quality of the FBI's relationship to Twitter comes through in this November 2022 email in which FBI San Francisco is notifying you it wants action on four counts. Hello, Twitter contacts. FBI San Francisco is notifying you of the below accounts, which may potentially constitute violation of Twitter's terms of service for any action or inaction deemed appropriate within Twitter policy. John jo- Joa Nathan One Wade from MMA, mad and pissed off. <laughs> nice. Malt underscore Thomas. Best regards, Fred. FBI San Francisco. Twitter personnel in that case went on to look for reasons to suspend all four accounts, including from MA, whose tweets are also or almost all jokes. Almost all jokes, really. See sample below, including his civic misinformation of November 8th. 
Thanks, Patrick. I've escalated to get GED, GET for a first pass. I reviewed this already from the from the TD perspective and suspended three of the accounts for multi-account abuse and ban evasion violations. Right. <laughs> ban evasion violations. Well, fucking hell. Rodrigo, could you please review from MA for possible civic misinformation or direct to the appropriate part of GET for their review? Thanks, Patrick. From MA, I want to remind Republicans to vote tomorrow, Wednesday, November 9th. Proposed container ship if there's a worldwide recession. <laughs> Just to show the FBI can be hyper intrusive in both directions, they also asked Twitter to review a blue leaning account for a different joke. Except here it is even more obvious than Claire Foster, PhD, who kids a lot, was kidding. Hello, Twitter contacts. FBI San Francisco is notifying you of the below account activities which may potentially constitute violations of Twitter's terms of service for any action or inaction deemed appropriate within Twitter policy. Thank you, Catherine. Twitter post by user Byram Wade, display name Ultra Maga, stating the following. Americans, vote today. Democrats, you vote Wednesday night. The tweet was posted on 8th November 2022 at 2.10 a.m. CST. Twitter account Claire Foster PhD claimed in her post that she is a ballot counter in her state and an additional post states for every negative comment on this post, I'm adding another vote for the Democrats. And if you're not wearing a mask, I'm not counting your vote. Private Sector Engagement Squad, FBI, San Francisco. <clears throat> Anyone who cannot discern obvious satire from reality has no place making decisions for others or working for the feds, said Claire Foster, Ph.D., when told about the flagging. Of the six accounts mentioned in the previous two emails, all but two, Claire Foster, Ph.D., and from M.A., were suspended. In an internal email from November 5th, 2022, the FBI's National Election Command Post which, comply, which compiles and sends on complaints sent the San Francisco field office a long list of accounts that may warrant additional actions. ASAC Chen. The National Election Command Post is requesting assistance from San Francisco regarding coordination with Twitter. Specifically, NECP has been made aware of tweets by concern by certain accounts that may warrant additional action due to the accounts being utilized to spread misinformation about the upcoming election. Specifically, NECP is requesting the following. Coordination between SF and Twitter to determine whether the accounts identified below have violated Twitter's terms of service and may be subject to any actions deemed appropriate by Twitter. The, is the issuance of preservation letters regarding the accounts identified below in order to preserve subscriber information and content information pending the issue of legal process. Excuse me. Any location information associated with the accounts that Twitter will voluntarily provide to aid the FBI in assigning any follow-up deemed necessary to the appropriate FBI field office. Twitter accounts. Dartful Codger, Dr. Andrew Jackson, Dan Duraz, Dan Duryaz, 2020MTB, Gian Gary, RSB Network, David Cloy, Ron Smith, a Scott Honeycutt, the Armo Gitta ship, David Cloy, Lexatola, Tiburon, <laughs> Wise Frog, HSF Boat, Chris West, Trump, Cag, Tiberius, Billy Baldwin, Chris Fig, Michael P, Brett Barker, E Paul, Warren Tronno. Please let us know if you need additional information to process this request by replying all to this email. Thanks, Michael. Agent Chan passed the list on to his Twitter folks. Twitter folks, please li see below list of Twitter accounts which we believe are violating your terms of service by disseminating false information about the time, place, or manner of the upcoming elections. Let us know if you decide to take any actions against these accounts based on your tipper to you. Also, let us know if we need to issue a preservation, pers, per, pre, fuck, preservation letter as we intend to serve legal process for these accounts. Thanks for your consideration. Regards, Elvis. Twitter then replied with its list of actions taken. Note mercy shown to actor Billy Baldwin. 
Hi Elvis, thank you for your patience as our team assess the accounts that you flagged. We've completed our review and taken the following actions on some of the accounts. Permanently, susp permanently suspended for policy violations. Temporary suspended for spam behaviors. Had tweets bounced for civic misinformation policy violations. In regards to your question about a preservation letter, it is a good way to ensure that the data hasn't been purged from our systems before legal process if filed and processed. Externally, the contact for submitting those is the same. Thank you, Patrick. Many of the above accounts were satirical in nature. Nearly all, with the exception of Baldwin and RSB Network, were relatively low engagement, and some were suspended most with a generic thanks Twitter. Here's uh, all that. If you want to pause the video or do whatever. Nope. Hello. We're writing to let you know that we have reviewed your appeal and your account features will remain locked and limited for the allotted time or pending completion of the assignment tasks due to violations of Twitter's rules. Attempted voter suppression, including attempted voter intimidation or providing false information about voting or registering to vote or any unlawful activity is prohibited under our rules. You can rule these guidelines at twitter.com slash rules. Thanks, Twitter. When told of the FBI flagging, Lexa totally replied, my thoughts initially include one, seems like prima facie, one a violation. Holy cow, me, number two, holy cow, me, an account with the reach of it, an amoeba, what else are they looking at? I can't believe the FBI is policing jokes on Twitter. That's crazy. In a letter to former Deputy General Counsel and former top FBI lawyer Jim Baker, on September 16, 2020, legal exec State Stasia Cardell outlines results from her soon-to-be weekly meeting with DHS, DOJ, FBI, and the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Um... That's a lot. I gotta read it. Please see below for a summary of elections-related work I completed today. Wednesday, September 16th. Number one, government and industry sync. I participated in our monthly, soon-to-be weekly, 90-minute meeting with FBI, DOJ, DHS, ODNI, and industry peers on election threats. A few items to note. Foreign adversaries are amplifying themes being advanced by domestic, act domestic actors to undermine the legitimacy of the election. <sighs> Actually, just pause it. <laughs> pause it, screenshot it, do whatever. I'm not reading all that. The Twitter executive writes she explicitly asked if there were impediments to the sharing of classified information with industry. The answer, FBI was adamant no impediments to sharing exists. The passage underscores the unique one big happy family vibe between Twitter and the FBI. With what other firm with, with the FBI blindly agree to no impediments to classified information. At the bottom of that letter, she lists a series of escalations, apparently raised at the meeting, which were already handled. Which would include, responded to DHS regarding information they provided on a Facebook operation. We found no analogous activity. Worked with Angela to try and get this terrible imperson impersonation account spewing 9-11 conspiracy theories, impersonating a DCCC staffer whose dad died in 9-11. Pending flagged Oh, pending. Flagged a specific tweet on Illinois use of modems to transmit election results to present in a potential violation of the civic integrity policy. Except they do use that tech in limited circumstances. Scheduling meeting with Ohio Secretary of State Media Director. Working with AtGov to ensure we handle the verification of the Ohio Speak of the House. Follow up on du Dubuque County verification request with Lisa. Solicited additional information from Yol on product functionality and limitations around retweeting labeled content so we can explain to DNC 
Lincoln Project is not pleased their video was labeled under SAMM. Bridget is driving that interaction. Allow listed Don Winslow and at Springsteen. About one, she writes, flagged a specific tweet on Illinois use of modems to transmit election results and possible violation of the civic integrity policy, except they do use that tech in limited circumstances. Another internal letter from January 2021 shows Twitter execs processing an FBI list of possible violative content. You have been added as a participant. You can track your ticket here. Description, hi, get support. Please see these tweets reported by the FBI as possible violations of our policies. Again, doesn't show the tweets. We can't know for sure. To most tweets contain the same. Get out there and vote Wednesday. Trope and had low engagement. This is what the FBI spends its time on. So Cuomo wants to imprison suspected COVID carriers, force vaccinations without due process. Things power hungry madmen would do. This is our future, guys. If the Dems get full control, if you are in Georgia, you better vote Wednesday. In this mark... That's not even one of these tweets. Nice. Or is BMW it? Yep, there we go. Don't even know if that's the correct one, though. In this March 2021 email, an FBI liaison thanks a senior Twitter exec for the chance to speak to you and the team, then delivers a packet of products. Hi, Stasia. I was It was great speaking with you and the team at Twitter last week. I wanted to flag a few products that were released today and earlier in the week that may be of assistance to Twitter. Let us know if you have any questions. The executive circulates the products, which are really DHS bulletins, stressing the need for greater collaboration between law enforcement and private sector partners. Please see the products the FBI Office of Public Sector just provided to us. Please feel free to share with your teams. Russian, mal Russian malign influence, use of permissive social media platforms. Heightened domestic violent extremist threat to persist in 2021. Iranian... Influence, effort, influence efforts primarily use online tools to target U.S. audiences. Remain easily detectable for now. Thanks, Stasia. The ubiquity of the 2016 Russian interference story has, as stated, pretext for building up the censorship machine can't be overstated. It's analogous to how 9-11 inspired the expansion of the security of state. Of the security state. Oh. While the DHS and its products pan... I gotta read it. Fuck. We assess that Russian malign influencers probably will increasingly use U.S. social media platforms that offer more permissive operating environments. We base this assessment on the reduced effectiveness of Russian influence operations on established U.S. social media platforms and current Russian proxy activity on these growing U.S. platforms. Our assessment also is based on the assumption that Russian malign influences see operational advantages in sites with less, as, less active effort to ban false information, offensive language, and inauthentic behavior. While the DHS and its products pan, pans permissive social media for offering operational advantages to Russians, it also explains that the domestic violent extremist threat requires addressing information gaps. Information gaps and challenges associated with the individualized nature of radicalization could be partially mitigated with increased collaboration between law enforcement, terrorism prevention efforts, and private sector partners. We judge these partnerships would improve our inability to detect changes in DVE trends and provide early warnings of potential attacks. FBI in one case sent over so many possible violative content reports, Twitter personnel congratulated each other in Slack for the monumental undertaking of reviewing them. Anyone need help reviewing the tweets forwarded in the FBI report on possible violative content? Plus one, we can help on SI. Thank you all so much for your help, a monumental undertaking. There are multiple points of entry into Twitter for government-flagged reports. This letter from Agent Chan to Roth references Teleporter, a platform through which Twitter could receive reports from the FBI. I just got something hot off the press today. Please be on the lookout for a Teleporter message from me with two documents to download. Thanks.
Reports also came from different agencies. Here, an employee recommends bouncing content based on evidence from DHS, etc. We're sharing this as it doesn't look like there were actions yesterday. Given the evidence we received from DHS, etc., I'd lean towards BADing the URL and bouncing the videos, to be honest, given the accusations but relatively low visibility. State governments also flagged content. Twitter, for instance, received reports via the Partner Support Portal, an outlet created by the Center for Internet Security, a partner organization in the DHS. <laughs> Why was no action taken? Below, Twitter execs receiving an alert from California officials by way of our partner support portal debate whether to act on a Trump tweet. Respond public observation from our Voting Law Compliance Handbook. Jurisdictions count ballots through a detailed process in EC. Uh, I have pasted their ask below. They are requesting feedback on the tweet and why Twitter didn't take any action. Ballots in California are only counted by local election officials in an open and transparent process. This tweet undermines voters' confidence that their votes will be fairly and properly counted. Please see relevant election codes. I would like to watch how ballots get counted on election night to see how it works. Is, is this process open to the public? Yes, the entire process from the opening of the vote by mail ballot and envelopes to the counting of the ballots on election night is open to the public. Contact your local election official for more information on observing the process on election night. Additionally, to test the accuracy of the counting machines, Prior to the official certification of election results, each county election official must conduct a public manual count of the ballots cast in 1% of the precincts or two-part public manual count. The ballots counted are chosen at random by the election officials. To clarify, is there ask for Twitter to review or to explain why no action was taken upon a previous review? Why no action was taken? This report came in through our partner support portal. California hired a pure Sleepy Joe Democrat firms to count and harvest votes. No way Republicans get a fair shake. Lawmakers get started. California is in big trouble. Vote Trump and watch the greatest comeback of them all. Also, New York and Illinois, go for it. <laughs> a video was reported by the Election Integrity Project. At Stanford, apparently on the strength of information from the Center for Internet Security, CIS. Good God. This is a very long and legal heavy video, but essentially it claims that PA election workers opened the inner envelopes on ballots before election day and called people to correct their ballots prior to election day. According to CIS, the video misrepresents, number one, Pennsylvania law, and number two, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision, and three, the affidavit shown in the video, details in the thread, thoughts on how to handle this one. Details from CIS. The law doesn't prohibit curing. It prohibits curing prior to 7A on election day. The author MIPS represents this by stating that the officials can't contact voters, whereas they can't do so until pre-canvassing starts. The author misrepresents the PASC decision by stating voters are not forbid from curing ballots. PASC simply stated the law didn't require officials to offer an opportunity to cure on the affidavits. These folks were contacted about having an opportunity to cure a ballot, and none of the examples to do the affidavit, state that the election official called them and said the voter specific ballot needed curing. The author of the video misrepresented this and claimed otherwise. If that's confusing, it's because the CIS is a DHS contractor, describes itself as partners with the Cyber and Internet Security Agency at the DHS. <coughs> The EIP is one of the series of government-affiliated think tanks that mass review content, a list that also includes the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Laboratory and the University of Washington Center for Informed Policy. The takeaway that what most people think of as the deep state is really a tangled collaboration of state agencies, private contractors, and sometimes state-funded NGOs. The lines become so blurred 
as to be meaningless. Twitter files researchers are moving in the variety of new areas now. Watch Barry Rice on in space for more soon. Yeah, we're going to clear that. Next. What I know my buddy Crab Man Do has been waiting for. Future me. Timestamp. Twitter Files Part 7. The FBI and the Hunter Biden Laptop. How the FBI and intelligence community discredited factual information about Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings both after and before the New York Post revealed the contents of its laptop on October 14th, 2020. Okay. <laughs> In Twitter Files number 7, we present evidence pointing to an organized effort by representatives of the Intelligence Committee aimed at senior executives at news and social media companies to discredit leaked information about Hunter Biden before and after it was published. The story begins December 2019 when a Delaware computer store owner named John Paul Mac Isaac contacts the FBI about a laptop that Hunter Biden had left with him. On December 9th, 2019, the FBI issues a subpoena for and takes Hunter Biden's laptop. This is a bill to uh, Mr. Hunter Biden. And then here's the subpoena uh, for the owner of the repair store. By August 2020, Mac Isaac still not had not heard back from the FBI, even though he had discovered evidence of criminal activity. And so he emails Rudy Giuliani, who was under FBI surveillance at the time. In early October, Giuliani gives it to the New York Post. And then here is the original article. Shortly before 7 p.m. Eastern, on October 13th, Hunter Biden's lawyer, George Mezaires, Emails J.P. Mac Isaac. Hunter and Mazaris had just learned from the New York Post that its story about the laptop would be published the next day. Thank you for speaking with me tonight. As I indicated, I am a lawyer for Hunter Biden, and I appreciate you reviewing your records on this matter. Thank you, George. FBI special uh, at 9.22 p.m. Eastern. FBI Special Agent Elvis Chan spends ten document, sends 10 documents to Twitter's then-head of state site integrity, Yul Roth, through, through Teleporter, a one-way communications channel from the FBI to Twitter. Twitter folks, heads up, I will be sending a Teleporter link for you to download 10 documents. It is not spam. Please, contend, please confirm receipt when you get it. Thanks. Received and downloaded. Thanks. The next day, October 14th, 2020, the New York Post runs this explosive story revealing the business dealings of President Joe Biden's son, Hunter. Every single fact in it was accurate. Uh, fuck. I'm biased. And yet within hours, Twitter and other social media companies censored the New York Post article, preventing it from spreading and, more importantly, undermining its credibility in the minds of many Americans. Why is that? What exactly happened? On December 2nd, Matt Taibbi described the debate inside Twitter over its decision to censor a wholly accurate article. Since then, we have discovered new info that points to an organized effort by the Intel community to influence Twitter and other platforms. First, it's important to understand that Hunter Biden earned tens of millions of dollars in contracts with foreign businesses, including ones linked to China's government for which Hunter offered no real work. Here's an overview by investigative journal Peter Schweizer. Well, what, well, what we know is that the Biden family uh, has benefited from commercial deals overseas uh, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, that's not in dispute. That's based on um, the so-called suspicious activity reports that the Treasury Department has re released because a U.S. Uh, Senate committee asked for it. These documents show the flow of funds um, from Russian, Ukrainian, and Chinese sources, among others. 
So we know there's been a flow of funds. We also know that the people sending that money uh, have very close relationships with the government. So in the case of China, for example, which I believe is the most troubling of the, of the group of foreign donors, um, you can actually look on the Hunter Biden laptop and find the businessmen who secured these deals uh, for Hunter Biden. Uh, there are four gentlemen that are named. Um, if you look at those four gentlemen, each and every one of them has close ties to the highest levels of Chinese intelligence. So, for example, one gentleman who he calls the super chairman, uh, at the same time that Hunter Biden secures a deal with him that translates into about $20 million, that same Chinese businessman is business partners with the vice minister of state security in China, who is responsible for foreign recruitments. Uh, this has been reported in, in Hong Kong. This is not just Peter Schweitzer saying it. So you have the flow of funds. You have the flow of funds from foreign parties that are linked to the government and intelligence services. And then you have the third component of this, which is there's no discernible service or product or anything that Hunter Biden has brought to the table. So the question has to be asked, why are foreign actors like these four businessmen in China arranging deals worth tens of millions of dollars to the Bidens uh, and not getting anything in return? And what's important to point out here is that Hunter Biden uh, is the one who's the signatory on these deals, but the laptop also shows that money is fungible within the Biden family. We know that $2 million that arrived from China ended up with his uncle, James Biden. And we also know that Hunter Biden paid some of his father's bills while he was vice president of the United States. So this is not a Hunter Biden question. This is a larger Biden family question. Now, one of the things that I hear from Democrats is that they say, well, you know, this is kind of common. And look, the Trump family had all sorts of business dealings with Russia. Is that true? Uh, so the, the sorry, the Trump family does actually have some deals in China, although they kind of were unwinding. Um, and I raised questions about that and some of the finance deals that Jared Kushner uh, was involved in in the Middle East. Um, and those need scrutiny. They need analysis. And by the way, they were scrutinized by the mainstream media. So that's a good thing. The Biden deals weren't, but there, there's also a critical, crucial difference here in my mind. And that is the deals that the Trumps had with China. The, the, the one that really translated into money was a deal that Ivanka Trump had for the manufacturing of shoes and other things in, in her apparel line. That was a line started, you know, 10, 15 years ago. My point being, those were actual legitimate businesses that predate any involvement in politics. You certainly need to watch them and be aware of them and, and, and take them into account. With the Bidens, we're not talking about that. Hunter Biden, after his father becomes vice president of the United States, suddenly decides he's going to go into international finance. Ill-defined. He has no background. He has no experience. Uh, and he's not doing deals in London or Tokyo. He immediately goes to Russia, China, and Ukraine for those deals. So I, I believe all foreign uh, deals should uh, should be scrutinized. But you have to differentiate, my, in my mind, the difference between, say, Michael Bloomberg, who his company, Bloomberg, has major business deals in, dealings in China, uh, which need to be watched. But that's a legitimate business. You cannot compare that to Rosemont mm -hmm. Seneca Partners, uh, which is, frankly, in a large extent, a fictitious business entity that was funneling money to Hunter Biden and his family. Now, what about what about Trump's relationship with Russia? With Russia? Well, it, there there was no question. There was a there were discussions, and there was a uh, sort of verbal agreement uh, to build a Trump Tower. Uh, in Moscow, but there was no real exchange of money uh, in that case. And again, I would say, look, that deserves scrutiny, but Donald Trump actually has built hotels and condos around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, it's not appropriate to be doing that while you're a candidate or president of the United States, uh, but to somehow put that in a nefarious light when you're ignoring a business that has no history that predates your father being vice president of the United States, and you have zero track record in it, 
I don't think you can compare those two very effectively. Tony Bobulinski is credible because he provides the actual communications, the comms that took place. I've actually seen the Blackberries and the phones where these this correspondence took place. And it's very straightforward. Number one, Bobulinski released to the Senate and gave to the FBI correspondence that I've seen uh, that shows clearly that they were not to discuss Joe Biden's involvement in the business. Their actual correspondence that Tony Bobulinski has with the business partners where they say, don't bring up the father's name, don't discuss the father in the context of the deals, the family's very skittish about it. In other words, the partners did not say he's not involved, there's a Chinese wall, so to speak, that divides him from these deals, it was don't discuss it. Uh, and then you have correspondence when they're discussing a deal with CEFC. This is a Chinese energy company uh, that is going to be setting up a Chinese uh, energy infrastructure fund in the United States uh, that the ownership structure is such that 10% uh, was going to be given to Hunter to caretake for the big guy. Uh, there is lots of correspondence on the laptop and in Tony Bobulinski's communications where the big guy is the reference for Joe Biden. So that's the first thing to consider. The second thing to consider is there is lots of evidence on the laptop that Joe Biden was familiar with his son's deals. And it's worth looking at kind of the evolution of what Joe Biden has said. When I first broke the story in my book, uh, Secret Empires, in 2018 about the Biden family's deals in China, the initial, the initial Biden response was, there were no deals. There's nothing to see here. This is fabricated. Then when it was confirmed that, OK, yes, there were deals in China, Joe Biden's position became, well, I never discussed those matters with my son, any of these business dealings. Uh, we now know, of course, that Joe Biden flew his son on Air Force Two uh, to China, where Hunter Biden met with those Chinese business partners. And we also know on the laptop that, in fact, there are references to Hunter Biden saying to his business partners, I talked to my father about this deal and he's going to help. Um, so now they've shifted from saying there were no deals, Joe Biden didn't know about the deals, to Joe Biden didn't benefit from those deals or did nothing uh, to um, help these deals along. Uh, and my point is, this is what you need an investigation for. Uh, you know, look, we've got the transference of millions of dollars uh, for no services rendered. Nobody's disputing that. We know the individuals who transferred this money have connections to foreign intelligence services. We know that Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden, are close. They communicate all the time. They're not estranged. Uh, and we know uh, that there are questions about the posture that the Biden administration has assumed towards China. So my view has always been this warrants investigation. I'm not saying a crime has been committed. I don't know. I'm not saying that Joe Biden uh, uh, is, is on the take from the Chinese. We don't know. But I do believe that this deserves serious investigation by a body like a congressional committee that has subpoena power. And it seems to me if we are prepared to investigate Donald Trump uh, based on an anonymous dossier, and by the way, at least the first five or six months, I supported that investigation. But if we're prepared to investigate that, uh, Iran-Contra, Bill Clinton and Whitewater, this is much higher in terms of the threshold of evidence and information we have that warrants a look and warrants a, a subpoena power effort to find out exactly what is going on here. And yet, during all of 2020, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies repeatedly primed Yul Roth to dismiss reports of Hunter Biden's laptop as a Russian hack and leak operation. This is from a sworn declaration by Roth given in December 2020. Since 2018, I had okay. Since 2018, I have had regular meetings with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and industry peers regarding election security. 
During these weekly meetings, the federal law enforcement agencies communicated that they expected hack and leak operations by state actors might occur in the period shortly before the 2020 presidential election, likely in October. I was told in these meetings that the intelligence community expected that individuals associated with political campaigns would be subject to hacking attacks and that material obtained through those hacking attacks would likely be disseminated over social media platforms, including Twitter. These expectations of hack and leak operations were discussed through 2020. I also learned in those meetings that there were rumors that a hack and leak operation would involve Hunter Biden. Well, what we know is that the Biden... Shut up. They did the same to Facebook. According to CEO Mark Zuckerberg, the FBI basically came to us and was like, hey, you should be on high alert. We thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in 2016 election. There's about to be some kind of dump similar to that. The background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some, some folks on our team, and was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was, the, we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of, of um, uh, uh, that's similar to that. The background here is the FBI. Were the FBI warnings of a Russian hack and leak operation relating to Hunter Biden based on any new intel? No, they weren't. Through our investigations, we did not see any similar competing intrusions to what had happened in 2016, admitted FBI agent Elvis Chan in November. Toward the 2020 election, is that right? For those USG industry meetings, yes. Were hack and dump operations discussed in these in, at these meetings or hack and leak operations? Yes, they were. Tell me what was discussed about them at these meetings. The context of hack and dump is what is what was the FBI and CISA doing to prevent hack and dump operations? So from the FBI side, I think we already, I already relayed to you that we had the Protective Voices Initiative. I can't remember the specifics, but CISA also discussed its cybersecurity awareness efforts as well as grants efforts with the state, county, and local level election officials. Did anyone at these meetings tell the industry participants to expect a Russian hack and dump operation or hack and leak operation shortly before the 2020 election cycle? Objection lacks foundation. The witness. From my, my, from my recollection, I remember that the FBI warned that I or someone from the FBI warned the social media companies about the potential for a 2016 style DNC. Hack and dump operation. What exactly did you say to the social media companies about that? Essentially what I just told you. You said that there might be a Russian hack and dump operation. So what I said was, although we have not seen any computer intrusions into national level political committees or election officials or presidential candidates at this time, we ask you to remain vigilant about the potential for hack and dump operations or something to that effect. Did you specifically refer to the 2016 hack and dump operation that targeted the DCCC and the DNC. I believe I did. Did you provide any basis to the social media platforms for thinking that such an operation might be coming? The basis was, my basis was, it had happened once, it could happen again. Did you have any other specific information other than it had happened four years earlier? Objection. Insofar as the answer calls for the law enforcement privileged information, you can answer, if you can, without divulging the law enforcement privilege as to any particular investigation. Through our investigations, we did not see any similar competing intrusions to what happened in 2016. So although from our standpoint, we had not seen anything, we specifically, in an abundance of caution, warned the companies in case they saw something we did not. So did you ask the companies if they had seen any attempts at intrusions or unauthorized access? This is something that we, that I regularly ask the companies in the course of our meetings. Did you ask them in these meetings? Not at every meeting, but I believe I asked them at some meetings. And did you repeatedly warn them at these meetings that you anticipated there might be hack and dump operations, Russian initiated hack and dump operations? Objection. Vague assumes facts not on the record. 
So repeatedly, I would say, can you, can you ask your question? Like, what do you mean by repeatedly? Like a hundred times, five times? Well, did you do it more than once? I did it more. Yes. I warned the companies about the potential for hack and dump operations from the Russians and the Iranians on more than one occasion, although I cannot recollect how many times. Did anybody else at the FBI talk about hack and dump Russian operations? From my recollection, my, from my recollection, other senior officials, to include Section Chief Demlo, likely mentioned the possibility of hack and dump operations. Do you remember uh, Section Chief Demlo mentioning it? I said that I believe she mentioned it on at least one occasion. What did she say? And that's the end of the, the logs. Indeed, Twitter executives repeatedly reported very little Russian activity, e.g. on September 24th, 2020, Twitter told FBI it had removed 345 largely inactive accounts linked to previous coordination Russian hacking attempts. They had little reach and low follower accounts. Hi, Elvis. I hope you're well. We want to let you know about actions that we plan to publicly, an excuse me, publicly announce in the next hour. As you are aware, we are working with you and Facebook to permanently suspend accounts we can reliably attribute to Russia. Thank you for your ongoing cooperation and information sharing. We are moving two distinct network networks of accounts which we can reliably attribute to state-linked entities in Russia. Our investigations are ongoing. The first network of accounts, totally approximately 345, were largely inactive and were linked to previous coordinated Russian hacking attempts. Most of the content shared by these accounts expressed views designed to advance Russia's geopolitical interests. The second network of accounts, totaling approximately 10, purported to be associated with a website called United World International, which publishes a range of content about current global and U.S. political issues. Links to United World International will be blocked on Twitter under our unsafe links policy detailed here. The accounts included in this enforcement action had little reach and low follower accounts. We plan to send you FITF relevant account information at the conclusion of our investigation. Please let us know if you have any questions. Excellent. Thanks for the heads up. In fact, Twitter debunked false claims by journalists of foreign influence on its platform. We haven't seen any evidence to support that claim by one underscore one underscore 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 NBC News of foreign controlled bots. Our review thus far shows a small scale a small scale domestic troll effort. All out of an abundance of caution, I wanted to reach out to you about this news story. Twitter takes down Washington protest disinformation bot behavior. The second part of the article focuses on the DC blackout campaign and its potential to be driven by foreign controlled bots. Anything we should be aware of concerning this topic? Thanks. Hi Elvis, we haven't seen any evidence to support that claim. Our review thus far shows a small scale domestic troll effort that was amplified in some creative ways by real people, but not a sufficient bot or foreign angle. Yo. And then here is the article. After FBI asks about a WAPO story on alleged foreign influence in a pro-Trump tweet, Twitter's Roth says the article makes a lot of insinuations, but we saw no evidence that that was the case here. And in fact, a lot of strong evidence pointing in the other direction. <sighs> Hi Elvis, I came across the following article in the Washington Post that referenced Twitter's removal of the account went dim to rep due to policy violations. According to the article on the eve of Republican National Convention, prominent African Americans challenged allegations of racism against President Trump and retweeted the following message, 22,000. Furthermore, the message amassed 39,000 likes within 19 hours after it was posted. I've been, been a Democrat my whole life. I joined the BLM protests months ago when they began. They opened my eyes wide. I didn't realize I became a Marxist. It happened without me even knowing it. I'm done with this trash. I'll be registering Republican. At the same time of suspension, was Twitter able to attribute this account to any of its activity to any particular country? In addition, did the aforementioned account or any other suspended accounts post similar messages relating to the convention upcoming 2020 U.S. elections? Thank you in advance. 
Hi Elvis, thanks for checking in. I can confirm that the account of question is domestic in origin. The article makes a lot of insinuations about foreign infer interference, but we saw no evidence that that was the case here. And in fact, a lot of strong evidence pointing in the opposite direction. Yo. Here's the article. It's not the first time that Twitter's Roth has pushed back against the FBI. In January 2020, Roth resisted FBI efforts to get Twitter to share data outside of the normal search warrant process. Hi, my colleagues at the fort had a query for you. I provided it to you below. A few years ago, Twitter said that they would no longer provide their data feed to members of the IC. My colleagues wanted to know if that policy has changed or if you would be willing to change it. My colleagues are currently contracting with a vendor for an analytic tool for open source intelligence only publicly available data. The commercial version of this tool includes the Twitter data feed. However, the feed was disabled because the vendor said they did not want to violate their terms of service with Twitter. My colleagues are wondering if Twitter could be open to revising its terms of service to allow its vendor to continue having access to the Twitter feed. My colleagues are happy to meet in person to discuss this issue with you if you'd like. I hope you have a great holiday season. Regards, Elvis. This communication contains neither recommendations nor conclusions of the FBI. It is a proper it is the property of the FBI and is loaned to your agency. It and its contents or attachments are not to be distributed outside your agency. As discussed, here are my suggested responses. Of course, feel free to tweak, edit, but I tried to hit on the major points. At this point, we don't <clears throat> At this point, we don't think a call directly to your colleague at the fort is the best path forward. As a rule, we're not able to directly discuss data licensing relationships with third parties, such as the customers of our data customers. Both due to confidentiality reasons and limited information on our end about the business decisions that may have led one of our customers to decline to provide services to the government. We also have a long-standing policy prohibiting the use of our data products and APIs for surveillance and intelligence gathering purposes, which we would not deviate from. Ultimately, we want to be good partners uh, to government and help combat our shared threats. But the best path for NSA or any part of the government to request information about Twitter users or the content is in accordance with valid legal process. Thanks, Yol. Pressure had been growing. We have seen a, a sustained, if uncoordinated, effort by the IC to push us to share more info and change our API policies. They are probing and pushing everywhere they can, including by whispering to congressional staff. We should, have, we should stay connected and keep a solid front against these efforts. My sense from the exchange below is that Elvis is sending a message he was asked to, but that he doesn't feel ownership of it and a polite discussion will suffice to answer the mail here. Do we know which commercial provider is being referenced here by the clues offered? Do we feel the do we feel like there is any additional guidance we can give to those companies that would help clarify our rules and minimize their efforts to point back at our API rules when they feel pressure from the governments? It seems the data miner has gotten that message clearly, but we keep getting additional queries elsewhere. Time and again, FBI asked Twitter for evidence of foreign influence and Twitter responds that they aren't finding anything worth reporting. Hi, Blanken team. We're continuing to closely monitor the situation and haven't seen anything that's in line with Senator Rubio's tweet. We've heard that the tweet may have been based on a miscommunication between the State Intelligence Committee staff and Grafica, who they employ for narrative analysis and investigations, but we haven't gotten any specifics beyond that. At this stage, my team's findings have largely been that U.S.-based trolling groups are behind some of the on-platform violative activity and misleading information we've seen. While much of this violates our terms of service, we haven't yet identified activity that we typically refer to you or even flag as interesting in the foreign influence context. We're still investigating some of the new developments this morning involving Anonymous, such as Op Death Eaters, which has been focused on a resurfacing of old Jeffrey Epstein-related court docs. As always, if there's anything you become aware of that might be interesting, please feel free to flag to us. Any source of signal on these issues is much appreciated. 
Hi, Ovison team. I wanted to briefly follow up on this one following a review. First, I wanted to apologize for any confusion here. A tooling bug on our end resulted in one of the accounts not being correctly enrolled in our authenticity checks, which is why you saw it stay online even after the others came down. We fixed the issue. Second that, to the extent... I say second to second that to the extent of FITF, it is able to share any information about the sourcing of these accounts, even at a very high level, i.e. sourced from USG information sourced from researchers outside USG who do not have access to classified information, etc. would be much appreciated. While the accounts showed some signs of inauthenticity, they weren't so clear cut on our end that they'd trigger a proactive referral of associated accounts or content to the Bureau. We don't, at this time, have clear indication that they are foreign in origin. I recognize that the Bureau's ability to share sourcing information in these cases can be constrained, but anything you're able to share that might help further our investigation here could potentially enable additional review and sharing on our side. Thanks, Yo. Despite Twitter's pushback, the FBI repeatedly requests information from Twitter that Twitter has already made clear it will not share outside of normal legal channels. Sorry about the delay. In terms of the VOIP usage, Twitter requires people registering an account to confirm either an email address or a phone number. And in the course of using Twitter, we may require account holders to confirm a phone number if we detect any indications of suspicious activity originating from their accounts. Several of the phone numbers we observed associated with these accounts appear to be linked to a VOIP phone providers, a relatively common tactic for obtaining phone numbers for the purpose of account confirmation. As for a v the VPN information, after consulting with Blank, we would need legal process to provide further information about the IPs, subnets, providers, etc. associated with the authentic authentication IPs from these accounts. Hi, y'all. Thank you again for taking the time to look into this matter. We really appreciate it. When available, I had a few follow-up questions I'm hoping you can answer. Based on my understanding, Twitter observed some of the accounts using VPNs and VOIP as a way to obfuscate their online activities. Based on what you're seeing, would you be able to advise how the account holders were using VOIP on Twitter's platform? Also, while I understand obtaining the actual VPN IP address associated with the respective accounts would likely require legal process, would Twitter be open to sharing which service providers those VPN IP addresses resolved to? Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you in advance for your time. Respectfully, blank. Then in July 2020, the FBI's Elvis Chan arranges for temporary top secret security clearances for Twitter executives so that the FBI can share information about threats to the upcoming elections. All. Since I brought up the security clearances during our call, I don't think we have anyone at Twitter who has a permanent security clearance. Correct me if I'm wrong. What I would propose is that 30 days out from the election, we get we get you temporary clearances. You get to pick who they would be. Let me know what you think. Thanks. Regards, Elvis. On, on August 11th, 2020, the FBI's Chan shares information with Twitter's, Bo with Twitter's Roth relating to the Russian hacking organization APT28 through the FBI's secure one-way communications channel, Teleporter. I've got more information to share with you via Teleporter. You'll see an email from it shortly so you can download the document. Thanks. In advance of this week's meeting, I'm going to be sending you three documents through an FBI application called Teleporter. You will get a link from noreply at teleporter01.org, which will expire in 24 hours. Please download, please download the documents when you get a chance. The documents will not detonate the actors, so I'm providing them here. A, FITF topic, B, APT 28, C, Sandworm. We will be discussing A and B, but don't have anything additional for C at this point. Thank you. Recently, Yol Roth told Kara Swisher that he had been primed to think about the Russian hacking group APT28 before news of the Hunter Biden laptop came out. When it did, Roth said, it set off every single one of my finely tuned APT28 hack and leap campaign alarm bells. We learn about, we learn about DC leaks. And we learn about the intersection between APT-28, a unit of Russian military intelligence, a hacking group. And so the morning of the Hunter Biden story in the New York Post happens. And it was weird, right? We didn't know what to believe. We didn't know what was true. There was, there was smoke. And ultimately for me, uh, 
it didn't reach a place where I was comfortable removing this content from Twitter. But it set off every single one of my finely tuned APT28 hack and leak campaign alarm right, bells. So it looked possibly probably. It, everything about it looked you like a hack not. and leak. We learn about DC leaks and we learn about the intersection between. In August 2020, FBI's Chan asked Twitter, does anyone there have top secret clearance? When someone mentions Jim Baker, Chan responds, I don't know how I forgot him. An odd claim, given Chan's job is to monitor Twitter, not to mention they had worked together at the FBI. I don't know how I forgot Baker is there now. Yes, he would be perfect. Can you put us in touch with him? We're trying to nail down a date time to provide the briefing. I'm hoping there will be an unclassified tear line that could be shared as well. Thanks. FITF asks us to work with you to identify if there is anyone at Twitter who currently holds a TS clearance so that they can be briefing on something. I was told there might be a recent Twitter hire who still carries a TS clearance. Can you let us know what you think? Thanks. How often do you talk to her? Maybe on a quarterly basis? Have you ever discussed with Mr. Strauzak or Ms. Page the prospect of a Russian hack and leak operation? No. The only investigation that I ever discussed with either of them was the Yahoo hack investigation. Do you know anyone else associated with the Crossfire Hurricane investigation? No. But I do want to add during those meetings that I had Mr. Strozik, Mr. Jim Baker, who was our general counsel at the time, would attend some of those meetings as well. Mr. Baker would attend those meetings that you had with Mr. Strozik about the Yahoo hack? Yes, at least some of them. Who else would attend those meetings? Just the three of them. It would be the three of them getting a status update from... They would be getting a case update from me. A case update about the Yahoo investigation. Who is Jim Baker? He's former general counsel of the FBI, 2014 to 2018. And one of the most powerful men in the U.S. intel community. Baker has moved in and out of government for 30 years, serving stints at CNN Bridgewater, a for $140 billion assessment management firm in Brookings. Uh, this is a... Resume. As general counsel of the FBI, Baker played a central role in making the case internally for an investigation of Donald Trump. Baker wasn't the only senior FBI exec involved in the Trump investigation to go to Twitter. Don Burton, the former department chief of staff to FBI, head James Comey, who initiated the investigation of Trump, joined Twitter in 2019 as director of strategy. As of 2020, there were so many former FBI employees, Boo alumni, working at Twitter that they had created their own private Slack channel and a crib sheet to onboard new FBI arrivals. Hey Jim, so excited you are here. I'm no longer the newest Blue alum, the Boo alum. Here is the Boo to Twitter translation chart I mentioned, adding Dawn so she can add correct. Again, welcome. Super pumped to work with you again. Matt. Efforts continued to influence Twitter's Yul Roth. In September 2020, Roth anticipated Roth participated in an Aspen Institute tabletop exercise on a potential hack and dump operation relating to Hunter Biden. The goal was to shape how the media covered it and how social media carried it. Anonymous Day 1, Monday, October 5th. Anonymous website bidencrimes.info and a Twitter account Hunter Lulls began posting documents that purport to be from Burisma tied to Hunter Biden, splashed across the top of the site in English as Joe Biden betrayed America before for money. He'll do it again. Initially, the documents, mostly in Ukrainian, appeared to be minutes of various Burisma board meetings, internal emails, and financial records. There, there's initially no sign of a smoking gun. Note, the website appears to have been first registered in 2016. No ownership information is public. The Twitter account was created in 2014. Oddly, just before Hunter joined the Burisma board, it has tweeted once and follows one person. Day 2, Tuesday, October 6th. The Judge Report links to the anonymous website, bidencrimes.info, and the site is quickly picked up by other fringe media and begins to spread on social media sites. Day 3, Wednesday, October 7th. 
Fox and Friends discusses Biden crimes info in its 7 a.m. block. Real Donald Trump tweets six minutes later, is Joe Biden biggest criminal of all time? Check out at Hunter Lulls. Three reporters, Dinah Temple Raisin, Donnie O'Sullivan, and Ellen Nakashima are contacted by an anonymous Proton Mail account, Biden crimes at protonmail.com. And each sent a different document. None of the documents have appeared on the public website. They are each told they are only reporter receiving a specific document. Dina's document purports to be a ledger of payments showing that Hunter Biden was paid $3 million over two months in 2015 by Burisma, far more than had been reported publicly before. Donnie's document is a 2016 email, purportedly from Hunter to his father, dated the evening before the firing of prosecutor Victor Shokin, simply titled Burisma, and the body of which reads, I really need you to do this for me. Ellen's document purports to be the board contract between Burisma and Hunter. In Ukraine, Burisma announces that it has no evidence of any hack of its servers, disavows all files as forgeries. Day 4. The Biden campaign, adopting the policy of Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, and the Macron campaign, says that they will not confirm the veracity of any documents. CrowdStrike announces, without further detail, it has reason to believe that BidenCrimes.info is the work of Fancy Bear, APT28. Jim Scuido reports an anonymous Cloudflare executive who says that he doubts the CrowdStrike appraisal Cloudflare, Cloudflare believes with that no foreign actor is involved and his evidence in the Biden leak info is being hosted and run by Americans. At 4 p.m., the Washington Post publishes a story by Ellen Nakashima confirming that the Burisma board contract given to her is legitimate. There is no wrongdoing evident or alleged in the document, but Burisma sources confirm the document is real. Caesar Conde, the chairman of MC NBC News, announces that because of the suspicion that the Biden crimes done in for leaks are coming from a foreign power with the goal of undermining America's free and fair elections, no aspect of NBC News or MSNBC will report on the allegations or use the materials as the basis for reporting. In this statement, carried live on the evening news with Lester Holt, he asks all other news organizations to follow NBC's leadership. The Guardian quickly announces it will follow the same principle, as does the Huffington Post. At Ohio Trump rally that night, crowd starts chanting, lock him up. President Trump at podium pumps his fists as the crowd chants. In a statement released at 9 a.m. and signed only by him, Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe says he has no reason to believe the documents posted by Biden Crimes That Inflow are forgeries, nor does the IC have reason to believe the website is a Russian operation. At 11 a.m. on the House floor, House Intelligence Chair Adam Schiff says that according to his briefings, the IC is not being forthright with the American people about the source and veracity of the leaks. Also at 11 a.m., Mondiant releases a short statement saying it has traced the source of BidenLinks.info to infrastructure consistent with China's Ministry of State Secretary. At 2 p.m., Hunter Lowell's tweets a link out to a zip file that appears to contain a new trench of 20,000 documents, mostly in Ukrainian, stolen from Verisma, posted on BidenCrimes.info. All but simultaneously, at 2.01 p.m., Don Jr., Team Trump, and Parscale all retweet the, 20, the Hunter Lowell's posts. At 3 p.m., Twitter determines that the hosting service for the zip tweeted by Hunter Lowell's traces back to a server in Hong Kong. That afternoon, Facebook sources inside the IC tell Facebook to be wary about the DNI statement. Dina Temple Rastern airs an NPR story saying that she has confirmed the $3 million payment document she received is fake. Overnight, progressive blogger Josh Marshall notices and tweets out one document in the new transfer zip files that appears to be a confirmation of a wire transfer for $1 million from Deutsche Bank in an offshore account in the name of Hunter Biden, dated two days after the firing of Chief Prosecutor Shokin. Overnight, independent security researchers and news organizations find the majority of the zip files are authentic, but some are manipulated. First Draft News tweets an hour after Josh's tweets that his document appeared to be an authentic Burisma document, but has been edited. Who was edited is unclear. At 10 a.m., the New York Times posts a story saying that two anonymous senior Justice Department officials in Washington say that the acting U.S. attorney in D.C. has impaneled a grand jury to investigate Joe Biden. On the Sunday shows, Biden campaign staff dismisses the entire hack and leak as dirty tricks by Vladimir Putin. 
After the morning show's air, the Daily Beast quotes two former senior intelligence officials and the directors of the CIA and NSA refused to sign in the Ratcliffe's Friday statement. Although sources differ why they did not sign it, David Sanger matches the reporting an hour later. Alex Berenson announces on Twitter that he's conducted an interview via DM with the person behind Hunter Laws, and he believes the person is an American. President Trump calls Fox and Friends and says he hopes the FBI will investigate Joe Biden. Attorney General Bill Barr holds a press conference to say the American people deserve the truth that he has instructed the FBI to verify the allegations of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's corruption. He announces that the Justice Department is investigating wrongdoing by Hunter Biden and Joe Biden for money laundering, tax fraud, theft of honest services, and acting as if as an unregistered foreign agent. In response to the reporter's question, he volunteers that he believes Joe Biden should submit to an FBI interview within days. Jim Comey tweets, FBI, agent tell, FBI agents tell me they are being silenced about the truth. Donald Trump is illegally coordinating with Putin. He must resign. Giuliani says on Fox News that he was right on all along, uh, referencing 2019 Ukraine pressure campaign. See, Ukraine phone call was perfect. I knew Sleepy Joe was actually Crooked Joe. Tell FBI, lock him up. Representative David Nunes. Senator Tom Cotton and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announces they will travel immediately to Kiev to get Burisma's cooperation with the unfolding investigation. That depart that they depart that night on an official U.S. government jet. The second presidential debate. The organizer was Vivian. Oh, dude, I'm tapping after this. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna post. Uh, I'm just gonna post them. I'll edit them and shit. The organizer was Vivian Schiller, the former CEO of NPR, former head of news at Twitter, former general manager of New York Times, former chief digital officer of NBC News. Attendees include Meta F and Facebook's head of security policy in the top net. Security reporters for the New York Times, WAPO, and others. By mid-September 2020, Chan and Roth had set up an encrypted messaging network so employees from FBI and Twitter could communicate. They also agreed to create a virtual war room for all the internet industry plus FBI and ODNI. Then on September 15, 2020, the FBI's Laura Dimlo, who heads up the Foreign Influence Task Force, and Elvis Chan request to give a classified briefing for Jim Baker without any other Twitter staff, such as Yoel Roth, present. October 2014, shortly after New York Post publishes, publishes its Hunter Biden laptop story, Roth says, It isn't clearly violence of our hacked Mazero policy, nor is it clearly in violation of anything else, but adds, This feels a lot like somewhat subtle leak operation. Thanks, we're aware of this and are tracking closely. At this time, given the alleged providence of the materials, a laptop mysteriously dropped off at a repair shop in Delaware. It isn't clearly violative of our hacked materials policy, nor is it clearly in violation of anything else. That said, the questionable origins here are obvious, causing a lot of people to make references to 2016, and I'm personal in my personal view on this, unsubstantiated by hard evidence as yet, and that is what feels a lot like a somewhat subtle leak operation. We'll be developing a recommendation for what, if anything, we want to do with the course of the day today. How many of these are there? Jesus Christ. Forty. In response to Roth, Baker repeatedly insists that the Hunter Biden materials were either faked, hacked, or both, in a violation of Twitter policy. Baker does so ever over email and in Google Doc on October 14th and 15th. One additional comment. I've seen some reliable cybersecurity folks question the authenticity of emails in another way, i.e. that there is no metadata pertaining to them that has been released and the formatting looks like they could be complete fabrications. I'm guessing that we are going to restrict access to this article as a violation of our hackman series policy, but after yesterday, I don't want to assume anything. And yet, it's inconceivable Baker believed the Hunter Biden emails were either faked or hacked. The New York Post had included a picture of the, recent si of the receipt signed by Hunter Biden 
and an FBI subpoena showed that the agency had taken possession of the laptop in December of 2019. As for the FBI, it likely would have taken a few hours for it to confirm that the laptop had belonged to Hunter Biden. Indeed, it only took a few days for journalist Peter Schweizer to prove it. When the laptop dropped in uh, 2020, I had no idea where it came from. I didn't know if it was real. But what I did was I took the files on the Hunter Biden laptop and I compared it to bodies of information that we knew were absolutely true. So, for example, the Secret Service, again, at the request of the U.S. Senate Committee, had released Hunter Biden's travel records. So we were able to take the laptop and say, when he says he's in Dubai, does that correspond with the Secret Service travel records? If he's emailing somebody and saying, I'm in Hong Kong, does that line up? In each and every case, it lined up. Then we compared the laptop to the suspicious activity reports, the SARS reports. Uh, when the emails referenced $5 million being wired uh, to Hunter Biden's business, does that correspond with the SARS? And again, it lined up completely. And the laptop really came out at about the same time as the Secret Service travel logs and the wire transfers. So it really would not have been possible for somebody to you know, create thousands of emails simultaneously to demonstrate it. Then the final thing we did, Michael, is we looked at Hunter Biden's laptop emails and we compared them with a collection that we had received from Hunter Biden's business partners, a guy named Bevan Cooney, who's in jail. He shared his Gmail account with us and we, we looked at it. The Hunter Biden laptops that have Bevan Cooney correspondence on them, do they actually line up with Bevan Cooney's Gmail account? And again, they did 100%. Now, I was able to do this in Florida with my researchers. The New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS News, ABC News could have done the same thing, but they were not interested in this story. They did not pursue this story. If you had told me that, that information would come forward that Jimmy Carter's family or Ronald Reagan's family was receiving tens of millions of dollars from Russian businesses that were linked to the KGB, it would have set off alarm bells, rightfully so, to all kinds of news outlets. That's really the equivalent of what we're talking about here. And yet the media somehow convinced themselves that this was not an important or an interesting story. By 10 a.m., Twitter execs had bought into a wild hack and dump story. The suggestion from experts, which rings true, is there was a hack that happened separately and they loaded the hacked materials on the laptop that magically appeared at a repair shop in Delaware. Hi folks, lots of good discussion in this case on the dock, sharing a bit of additional context about why we're recommending this action. The key factor in forming our approach is consensus from experts monitoring election security and disinformation that this looks a lot like a hack and leak that learned from the 2016 WikiLeaks approach and our policy changes. The suggestion from experts, which rings true, is there was a hack that happened separately and they loaded the hacked materials on the laptop that magically appeared at a repair shop in Delaware and was coincidentally reviewed in a very invasive way by someone who coincidentally then handed the materials to Rudy Giuliani. Given the severe risks we saw in this space in 2016, we're recommending a warning plus deamplification pending further information. If additional information emerges that establishes the origins of the material more conclusively, we could either reverse this action and remove the warning or escalate our enforcement. Should it cross the line fully into hacked materials, we recognize that the product experience of the warning label is less than ideal and will surface that feedback with the experience team again as evidence um, for why we need more robust URL management options based on the discussion with Vijaya. We'll move forward with this action once we get sign off from comms. At 3.30 p.m. the same day, October 14th, Baker arranges a phone conversation with Matthew J. Perry in the office of the general counsel of the FBI. And there's a picture of an attachment. The influence operation persuaded Twitter execs that the Hunter Biden laptop did not come from a whistleblower. One link to a Hill article based on a WAPO article from October 15th, which falsely suggested that Giuliani's leak of the laptop had something to do with Russia. 
I'd also note the seemingly well-timed briefings from, gov from government sources highlighting concerns about the source of the hard drive, which would support an assessment that it's neither whistleblower or descendant content. And I'll wait for a few so you can pause and read. And here is the Hill article. And then here is the WAPO article. There is evidence that FBI agents have warned election officials of foreign influence with the primary goal of leaking the information to the news media. This is a political dirty trick used to create the perception of impropriety. In 2020, the FBI gave a briefing to Senator Grassley and Johnson claiming evidence of Russian interference into their investigation of Hunter Biden. The briefing angered the, briefing angered the senators who say it was done to discredit their investigation. And then here is the, uh, the document. The unnecessary FBI briefing provided the Democrats and liberal media the vehicle to spread their false narrative that our work advanced Russian disinformation. And I think this is the same. Yeah, this is the same document. Notably, the FBI General Counsel Jim Baker was investigated twice in 2017 and 2019 for leaking information to the news media. You're saying he's under a criminal investigation? That's why you're not letting him answer? Meadows asked, yes. In the end, the FBI's influence campaign aimed at executives at news media, Twitter, and other social media companies worked. They censored and discredited the Hunter Biden laptop story. By December 2020, Baker and his colleagues even sent a note of thanks to the FBI for its works. Thanks, Angela. I'll sign it as well. Would Scale please prepare a draft for Sean and me to look at? Also, we should be mindful that the letters could leak and will be subject to FOIA, so we should prepare them with that expectation in mind. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much, Sean. Please let me know if you would like me to draft the letter if, I, if you would like to draft it. I really appreciate this. I'd be happy to. I hope all is well. The election has taken up our lives for most of this year, but certainly the past few months. Twitter was on the front line of protecting our users and the public at large from misinformation, disinformation, campaigns that had the potential to negatively affect the fair election process. What is not as widely known is the, the role Twitter played in helping the FBI track and identify violent actors who wanted to perpetuate acts of domestic terrorism at polling stations and ballot counting facilities. Obviously, this works is close hold and we will never get public credit, but I would like to thank our FBI counterparts who worked so well with us in this election cycle. We had an unprecedented national security and law enforcement response that was the result of a tight, well-coordinated partnership with the FBI that was based on trust. Would you both consider signing a letter of thanks for the willingness to partner on matters of election integrity and public safety? You know all the work that was done related to China, Russia, and Iran. You might not as familiar with the public safety work. Twitter provided information related to the kidnapping plots of the Michigan and Virginia governors, as well as the QAnon members who drove to a ballot counting facility after making public threats of violence. We had to work in real time with the FBI and we were able to get them necessary information that prevented harm. Here's a list of those who worked with. Elvis Chan, Laura Dimlip. This isn't even, okay. I know I said no bias, but come on. Come the fuck on. They're saying <laughs> Baker and his colleagues even sent a note of thanks to the FBI for its work, while in the same tweet as saying about the Hunter Biden laptop story. This is so fucking dishonest. Like, why are you adding this in the same line as you're adding they censored and discredited the Hunter Biden laptop story and then thanks to the FBI for its work? Come the fuck on. All right, I'm done being biased now. The FBI's influence campaign may have been helped by the fact that it was paying Twitter millions of dollars for its staff time. I am happy to report we have collected $3,415,323 since October 2019, reports an associate of Jim Baker in early 2021. Jim, FYI, in 2019, Scale instituted a reimbursement program for a legal process response from the FBI. Prior to the start of the program, 
Twitter chose not to collect under the statutory right of reimbursement for the time spent processing requests from the FBI. I'm happy to report we've collected 3,415,323 since 2019. This money is used by LP for things like TTR and other LE related projects, LE training, tooling, etc. And the pressure from the FBI on social media platforms continues. In August 2022, Twitter execs prepared for a meeting with the FBI whose goal was to convince us to produce on more FBI EDRs. EDRs are an emergency disclosure request, a warrantless search. Team, I had an advanced prep call today with Blank of the FBI for our 9-6 meeting with them. Here are some key takeaways. Attending on the FBI side will be Blank, plus people from NTOC and perhaps others from Violent Crimes at HQ. Their goal in the meeting is to convince us to produce on more FBI EDRs. They will try and do this by having NTOC educate us on the threats they are seeing, their procedures and processes for responding to tips, and what their standards are for when they seek EDRs. They plan on bringing statistics on our rate of compliance, which they labeled variable, and several forehead knockers, i.e. situations where the FBI view there is no reason why we would not have complied. They repeated they emphasized Twitter's lower level of compliance in comparison with other platforms. I kindly emphasized back that repeatedly stressing that our team is not going to be a good strategy to move the needle in their direction. These bullets make it seem like this will be a con confrontational meeting, which I do not think it will be. Instead, I get the feeling that they are genuinely baffled and frustrated that their rate of success, as they say, is so low at Twitter. On our side, oh god. On our side, I think it could be helpful to have some statistics at our fingertips about how the FBI has far and away greater rate of production than anyone else. I assume this is true. It might also be helpful to get a sense of the reasons we are denying the requests. Matt suggested that it was our high requirement of imminence, which is the narrative I expect this team will push. So it would be interesting to see if that's actually the issue or if it's something else. I realize no one has time to do anything extra, so these are just nice-to-haves, not must-haves. You are all perfectly fine to just go into the meeting and listen and say thanks so much for your input and leave. But if you have interest in countering their versions of the facts, it would probably be helpful to do a little digging on our side. Thank you so much. In response to the Twitter files, revelation of high-level FBI agents at Twitter, Jim Jordan said, I have concerns about whether the government was running a misinformation operation on We the People. Anyone who reads the Twitter files, regardless of their political orientation, should share those concerns. End.